Shut up and sit down. All right, everybody, we're back with another episode of the Bowhunter Chronicles podcast. Man, it seems like forever, our first podcast of 2020. So um, we're back from ATA. I recorded a couple great episodes there and um, got to see some real cool products. We'll do a kind of a wrap-up video on that here coming up pretty soon. Um, This episode, uh, Jason Samkowiak is a Michigan guy known you know, all over the country, great hunter, hunts uh, everywhere, traditional hunter. And uh, we just want to reach out to him and kind of uh, talk a little bit about, you know, uh, how he uh, breaks down these different um, states. You know, he hunts Kansas, Missouri, Michigan, Georgia, uh, hunts all over. And uh, just wanted to just wanted to talk to him. I mean, he's tr- traditional hunter, hunting from a tree stand. Um, so he's uh, he's getting it done pretty much everywhere. Uh, gear oriented guy, um, got a, a system down, and um, you know he, he's got a, a bow hunting class out there. Uh, I guess you're probably. Uh, check out if, if that's something if, if that's a way that you want to learn um but um yeah i just wanted to talk to him a uh, great guy he's got some really good information out there and uh real fun episode um and you know we're, we're back uh happy to be putting out podcasts again man uh 2020 has been kicking our butt it's been absolutely awful between um you know we started off with the holidays and then sickness and then um uh, some deaths in the family and just, you know, all sorts of things that are, you know, just just really kicking our butts. So uh, we're happy to get up and get rolling and uh, we're going to get back on our, our regular schedule. Um, Chris McRae out of uh, Virginia, I believe, uh, won our um, quarterly giveaway for our Patreon. So we won that full-on saddle kit and uh, that's going to be in the mail here really shortly. Um, we actually talked to Trophy Line while we were at uh, the ADA show. So uh, I talked to Sean and uh, passed along all that information, and then uh, I'll get that out um, out to you, Chris, here. And, you know, thanks to all our, our new Patreons, uh, Ian Volkoff, uh, Eric Redder, um, Tim Jackson, um, you know, from a few Michigan guys, and I'm, I think, I know Eric's not from, from around here, maybe Indiana, I'm not sure. Uh, sorry, Eric, if I didn't get that right, but there's there's a boatload of them. I don't have the the list in front of me. I'm kind of doing this haphazard, but um, you know our Patreons, uh, we do a quarterly giveaway to give back to the people that support the show. Patreon is a uh, a small donation to the show. It comes auto drafted every month, and um, you know those those guys and uh, and gals who who support the show. Um, we want to do everything that we can to do to uh, give back. So we, when we were at, um, uh, for example, while we were at the ATA show, uh, we got some swag bags from the Badlands Film Festival. We got a bunch of hats and shirts and some other goodies that uh, we're going to divvy up amongst the Patreons and send those out. And then um, we give away, you know, bigger things quarterly. And um, real quick, uh, Tioga Rice Coffee. Um, we had Brett on the show uh, a while back, and it's it's great country for the ba- uh, coffee for the back country instant coffee that doesn't taste like instant coffee. You can use it hot or cold. Um, our tickets for ATA got messed up, and uh, Frank wasn't going to be able to get in, um, so we uh, made some phone calls, called around anybody that we knew, and um, weren't able to get a ticket until last minute uh we contacted brett and brett said yeah no problem give me a minute and we got there uh there was one waiting at the desk for him so um you know just like the patreons you know we want to give back to those people that help out the show and those people that support us so um if you're into uh backpacking elk hunting if you're uh, going out um you know where you you need that pick me up even for the tree stand you know it's it's hot or cold um check out tioga rice coffee it really is a good product and if you just want some samples reach out to brett he will get some to you um but like i say i can't say enough about you know how he helped us out so this isn't uh you know 
he, a shameless plug that, that Brett's, you know, Tioga Rise is the best coffee because they're giving us money or, or doing anything like that. Um, a great company, great people behind it, and we just really do, you know, appreciate that just like we appreciate the Patreons. And, uh, you know, so if you um, are interested in Patreon, and you want to help out the show, you're interested in, you know, the giveaways, kind of the stuff that we do. Um, the, the We did we recorded two live podcasts while we were at uh, ATA, and uh, we had our Facebook Live going for those for our Patreon, so they kind of got to pop in and out there. We did some, uh, you know, uh, product reviews and things like that uh, for the Patreons while we were there. Um, so there there is a, some additional benefit to that as well. Um that's pretty much all I've got for today. Um, enjoy this episode, and we've got some great ones coming up. Thanks for listening. All right, everybody, Adam and John back with another episode of the Bow Hunter Chronicles podcast. Today, we're talking with, of all things, another traditional archer, a uh, very inspirational guy, uh, lots of information, and, and he just wants to to give it out to you inspirational for us i mean where this is going to be podcast 89 i think and uh he's on podcast way into the 300s can't even count them anymore uh jason samkoviak with the uh, traditional bow hunting and wilderness podcast um you know he's got a lot of different stuff going on youtube uh all different stuff and uh, real excited to talk to him. Been talking to him for a while here, and uh, finally just decided to uh, start recording. So, how are you doing tonight, Jason? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Doing good. Are you still uh, hunting at all? You're a Michigan guy, but you do a lot of traveling. So, uh, I am actually. I'm technically done deer hunting, with the exception uh, here in in where I'm at, Northern Michigan, it's over, but down in Southern Michigan, uh, some of the places I work at for my job, they have, uh, they have the season goes till February 1st down in a couple counties down there. And I'm possibly going to maybe get out for one or two days down there. If my schedule allow, like when I have to head down there for work, I might go a day early and try and get in a, an evening hunt here an evening hunt there. Um, but for the most part, it's pretty much done. And now I'm focusing on hogs down South. Um, we bought a camper and we, we went down in, uh, for vacation, uh, what the week between Christmas and new year's. And, uh, I scouted out a couple WMAs in Georgia and, uh, we dropped the, left the camper down there in Knoxville and we're going to go back down, uh, for five days later on this month for some hogs and then try and get down there for a week in February and a week in March and see if we can't get some public land hog hunting done. But as far as deer and Michigan or deer, pretty much done for me now. Okay, yeah, I, I knew you were going back and forth between Georgia. I just didn't know if the the season was done yet down there or or what. I think their deer season is is end somewhere here mid January as well too, or something like that. But I don't know. I've never hunted deer down there. I've actually only hunted down there twice. I went down there two times for hogs last year, exploratory. I went down there for uh, a two day trip, and then I went down, and then mountains, and then I went for a uh, three day trip down in the swamps, and uh, I fell in love with both of them. And I had a, I had a wild hog on that first trip in up in the mountains. Uh, the last night I was there, I found really good sign, and I I kind of had it pinned down to where they were bedding at in this real thick stuff um, in this drainage, and I set up on where they would come out of that where the wind would be good. And I had a I had a pretty good sized hog come into within four yards of me, but he faced me the whole time. I was on my knees, I couldn't do nothing. And, uh, so that was, that was, that hooked me. I was, I've killed a lot of hogs. I think I've killed, uh, 12 or 14 hogs, but honestly, they've all been like preservation hogs, like where you went on a boar hunt someplace, you know, um, like in Tennessee and things like that. So these are, this is my first attempt at wild, at, uh, free range wild hogs and I'm having a ball with it. Yeah. That's something I know John's been wanting to do for, for quite some time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you guys being Michigan guys like I am, you know, January, February, and March here are pretty miserable times. And to be able to to leave here in January and go down there where it's sixty five or seventy degrees, and you get to hike the woods out there and walk in swamps and stuff like that, and the snakes are pretty much gone, the gators are gone. You know, there's not much to, to worry about there. Poison ivy is about the only thing; it's everywhere. But other than that, you're you're pretty safe to you know explore and roam and do whatever you want to, and it's pretty beautiful, you know, and you're you're hunting hogs. <laughs> Yeah, sounds good. So with uh, with you being a, a a Michigan guy, you know we we generally uh, enter into these things saying, you know, how did you like? What was your upbringing hunting and um, kind of how has it, it it evolved like over the years? Uh, and then what's your hunting style today? 
Well, I, I, I actually come from a non-hunting family. Nobody in my family ever hunted. Uh, I do remember when I was a little kid, my dad actually went out and he bought a 22 rifle. Um, he took us out in the woods. We walked down a couple two tracks and some power lines a couple of times, but we, you know, we knew nothing. We weren't even old enough to touch a gun, but, um, and then my parents got divorced. And then, uh, one of my mom's boyfriend, uh, said that I, in order to be a man, I should learn how to hunt. So he took me to a bear stand and he put me in a bear stand and gave me a double barrel 10 gauge at age 12 and left me sit there and made me forgot about me until way after dark and came back and got me. And that kind of freaked me out a little bit. Um, and then, uh, uh, it was, I got my first bowl later that year at 12 from that same boyfriend of my mom's. And, uh, and so I enjoyed the, I had the bowl and I shot it a little bit. I did walks in two tracks and stuff like that. I think I shot an arrow at deer one time that next year when I was 13, I think those deer were, uh, I don't know, maybe about 130 yards. I think my arrow <laughs> went about 40 yards and hit the dirt, you know, but, uh, and that was about it. And then, uh, uh really nothing else to it. And then when we, I moved down to the Detroit area from Northern Michigan, my senior year of high school. And when I did, I, I kind of missed it. Cause I, even though I wasn't into much hunting, I was always into all the power sports, boats, snowmobiles, motorcycles, ATVs, skiing, everything that you would do uh, up North. And uh, so I really missed it. So hunting was kind of a way to get back up here. So while I was living down there, I went to, I joined a shotgun league, a skeet league, and I was shooting at, and at the same place, there was guys shooting bows and I was like, man, you don't have to buy bullets for that. You don't have to buy clays. I can just buy one set of arrows and keep shooting all the time. And uh, so I, I bought a bow, and then uh, I got good with it, and I decided I would hunt. So I was 19 years old, and uh, on the third day of the season, the first time I could hunt, I went out and I sat. I, I found a whole bunch of tracks, deer tracks, where they crossed the old motorcycle trail, and I sat down on there, and then uh, I was, it was kind of – it was a suicidal deer – um, because that morning I sat there I, that night, I, I heard deer snorting at me. I went back to the same spot the next morning. I sat down next to a poplar tree and I had my back to it. I heard, you know, deer coming through the woods, you know, hooves crunching leaves. And, uh, well, they came up, they were about 12 yards behind me. It was three does and they stopped directly behind me downwind. I looked over my shoulder and I saw them standing there Well, my bow was laying on the ground next to me in the leaves. I basically turned, rolled around onto my knees, stood up off the ground completely, bent down, picked my bow up, stood up, pointed it into the sky to draw it, lined up that pin on her and shot. And she stood there the whole time waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't even know how to field dress it, so I had to flag some guy down on the road. He came over and showed me what to do with it. And uh, and then that was it. I was hooked ever since. And then so it's all been a self-taught learning curve. Nobody showed me any part of anything on anything of it. It's just all research and. We didn't have the internet then, so it was a lot of magazines and books, and I got so many books from so many great people that, you know, that not only they teach you how to hunt, they instilled the ethics aspect and the stuff like that, and, and there's a lot of that that's not available or, or heavily talked about today, you know, a lot of the internet stuff, but if you go back to the books and the, the things of that, they uh, they really taught you to respect it and to learn from the woods, to become a student of it and, and let it teach you what you need to know rather than giving you foolproof tactics. And uh, and, they, and that's kind of what took it to it. And then I, uh, so I got into it and I stayed hunting forever. And then when we had kids, when me and my wife got married and we had kids, uh, we decided we wanted to raise them the same way. Um, so I quit my engineering job. I was, I actually was already into it for about a year of doing photography as a side job. And uh, within that year of having kids, we decided, I said, you know what, I can make this full time. It'll be hard, but I can do it. And uh, we could move up north. And so we did. We uh, bought a house up north. We moved into it. And uh, I ever, that was, you know, 19 years ago. And now I travel back and forth to Detroit area all the time. So my work is all still down there. So I go down there on the weekends and shoot weddings and things like that. And, uh, and it allowed us to come up here and raise the kids in an environment we wanted to and teach them how to do all this stuff. And it gave me the opportunity to uh, spend a lot of time in the woods since I, I work from home and I only have to be a certain place on like a Friday and a Saturday and Thursdays for meetings. That gives me Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and often more time. But um, I get those times to be able to hunt quite a bit. And so uh, starting off the way that you did um, and having to learn uh, as you went, how do you think that uh, – with other people that you've run into and hunters, like, you know, you kind of got a little bit of my backstory and, in John's and, and things like that. Uh, you know, while, when we were talking here, but how do you think the self-taught 
hunter um, aspect of it. Do you think that it made you a better hunter because you didn't have any bad habits and you had to seek out the information where it wasn't easy to come by? Um, I mean, you look at guys, you know, we had talked about before the podcast, like Dan Infall, that's the same thing where he, he said, you know, nobody really hunted and he just went out and figured it out on his own. You know, my father-in-law the same way he'd say, you know, well, I, I just went out and, you know, found some tracks and, and set on there. How do you think that that was, how, how do you think that shaped you as a hunter? Um, so basically in a nutshell, what you're getting at is what do you think is the differences between a self-taught hunter and somebody who's had somebody show them the ropes? Well, uh, to a degree, I mean, there's lots of uh, great hunting families out there, people that have, you know, been taught the right way, you know, one way or the other. I mean, not just drinking beer and shooting right. roadside deer in the headlights, but and there's, you know, there's enough of that around for sure. Um, but it seems like a lot of the adult onset hunters that we talk to uh, are more similar to um hunters of the old times where there wasn't the internet and there wasn't so much information and hunting maybe wasn't as prevalent or on tv um i think because they had to want it or it was a necessity um maybe in the the old times but the adult onset hunters have to actually seek it out i think yeah and there's um, being self-taught, I can't say what it's like to not be self-taught, mm -hmm. but I can say that I, I, what I did is I gained a lot of knowledge through a failure and that failure, um, not only did it, and I don't mean that it turned out as failure, but what I thought was failure at the time, not only tells you where not to step and what not to do, it also shows you what you can get away with when you cheat the system, little, um, you know, simple ways of being able to get around this or, um, you know, to understand, yes, deer are supposed to do this, but in the past I've seen them do this because I did this this one time. You know, there's, um, you, you, you know, where if you, I would honestly think if you came from a hunting family um, and you or somebody showed you, you had a mentor, he's going to show you the right way to do stuff and not tell you the things that don't work um, because he doesn't want to waste your time with what doesn't work or not show you how to make these mistakes. And when you, you do have the option of making those mistakes and you're forced to do them. I do believe that it shows you um, some of the gray areas of things that you can, some of the more aggressive moves, some of the, the more, well, not every deer does this, but I have seen deer do this in the past. What if one does today um, kind of, you know, situations where you're not afraid to think outside the box a little more, um, you know, so I, but I, again, I would almost call it a, you know, again, the, the being self-taught is, First, wishing I had somebody teach me. There's there's so many pros and cons to both sides that it's a wash either way. I mean, there's advantages, but do I wish that I would have had a, a dad that would have taught me how to hunt that I could have shared that time with and even now be out there with my dad in a tree stand and, and be able to watch him and, and reverse that mentorship role of him teaching me to me maybe teaching him and helping work carry his animals out and do this stuff yeah i wouldn't trade I, i'd love to have that i don't but i'd love to you know i have it with kids and i can teach them things but as far as um you know that kind of thing being having somebody there like you do like you guys do i i, I would trade everything i did on my own to have that for the camaraderie and the experience of being able to share that with somebody would be way more powerful not having it like i said has got some major benefits of letting you really just uh you know, there is no, you, you learn that there is no rules where I think if you're brought up by a hunting mentor or somebody like that, they are showing you what they think are rules. And when you don't have that, there are no rules. So you find out for yourself what does work all the time, what never works, and sometimes what might work and how to bend the rules a little bit. <laughs> it's funny that you say that. I was just having a conversation with my brother about that. He says, you know, well, I can only hunt this day and I can only hunt this spot because of the time and the wind is going to be, you know, this, what do you think? And I said, well, I said, those deer, they're going from here to there. They're going to move. If they're there, they're going to be moving. They don't, the deer, the, yeah, everybody says play the wind, but the deer are moving there. You need to play the wind because the wind's going to be blowing your wind towards the deer. If you have an idea of where the deer are and the way the wind's going to be, you can try and cheat that as best as you can if that's your only option. And he's like, I, you know, I never really thought about it like that. But it's like you're only, you think, well, I can't do this because so-and-so said that I can't. 
It's like, well, you you'll never know if you don't get out there and do it. And yeah, you gotta give it a try. Yeah, I mean, if that's yep. your only, you'll option, never kill a deer from the couch. Right. right. And, uh, yep, and like you with what you just said on there too, with that wind, you know, that type of scenario, you know, um, those are always the best odds, you know, those, <clears throat> those trips where, or those times where you're out there, when you can give that deer, um, actually I think in fault that you guys talk to and stuff, I think he calls it a gist off wind. Yep. Okay. But when you find that opportunity where that deer, where the deer feel that that wind is in their corner, they're going to move earlier. Okay, they're still, you're right, they're still going from point A to point B. But if the wind is 100% going from point A to point B as well, too, they're going to move much later at night because they don't have the security of the wind. They only have the security of darkness. The only thing that gives them security in darkness is that they know that they've never bumped into a person in the dark. There's no fear of people in the dark whatsoever, so they use that as a is a security measure but if you if the wind is blowing a to b and the deer are moving from a to b they're going to move later on but if the wind is blowing from b to a they now have that super powerful security system of that wind being in their favor so they're going to move earlier so they can eat earlier and eat more and spend more time out there um and when they're doing that but now if you can find somewhere on that point of a to b that that makes a a 30 degree turn on that trail that is going to send your wind on the inside of there and it's not going to catch them. And you can get down that on that break of that trail where now your wind is going to be still blowing in their face, but they're because of the way the trail is, they're 50 or 60 yards over before, you know, and they got to make that turn to come to you that just off wind, like that kind of a scenario is they feel that they're a hundred percent safe, but that trail is going to take them on a slight advantage. It's going to give you that favor in that one small area. And if you can walk in and set up on that particular area and set up, you're going to, you'll, that's the difference between one night in the same spot of seeing 20 deer and one night, the same spot of seeing two deer right before dark. (laughs) Yeah. And I, you know, I, I think if you spent, and that's, that's what's so hard is there's so many guys out there that, haven't spent a, a ton of time in the woods or they've only hunted. I mean, I, I'm a hundred percent guilty of this. Like I said, before I got into all of this mobile hunting and climbers and all that, I mean, the property that I grew up on had 10 stands on it. And so you just went to your stand. And then yep. if, if, you know, this guy wasn't there, you had the opportunity to hunt his stand or your stand but that was it. And you just sat there and you waited and you hoped. And I, I, I feel like th- that's kind of what I was getting at is, is the, the learning to hunt on your own is it, like you said, is, is easier to figure out what works and what didn't rather than just being put in a spot like, like your, your bear stand with the double barrel 10 gauge saying, you know, they probably didn't say this is why you're here and this is where they're going to come from. And usually they do this and you might find one over here. Um, it's like, well, just sit here and at dark, they usually come out over there and it's a good spot because we killed the deer here in 1975. And and that's kind of right. like the way that I grew up. And I think a lot of people, especially Michigan hunters with bait and, and everything, um, and then you watch the stuff on TV and, you know, it's just so easy to sit this field edge and these bucks come out and they, you know, they're all out in the field and they come through this perfectly manicured food plot and then we're just going to kill them. So we put up a food plot and we sit in the same stand every night and wait for that perfect scenario to happen, you know, and, and you don't have those failures because you've set yourself up to fail. So the deer know exactly what's going to happen. And they're just there when you're not, you know, and I, I think that that's kind of like what I was saying is like, that's the way that I was brought up hunting was like, you go and you sit there and then we'll sit there for a week and we'll have a good hunting camp, but we won't kill a whole lot of deer. You right. might get lucky and kill one <laughs> or two in the first couple of days. And... <laughs> right. <clears throat> yep. You know, what used to crack me up all the time with the deer camps up here. And, and I never, like I said, I never was part of that because I didn't come from a hunting family, but I had a lot of friends that did. And I knew a lot of people up here that did the same, they did, did those. I was even invited to a lot of them and, and did hunt in a few, but I was never technically part of them. But I always loved when on opening day of gun season, that the dads would always take their 14 year old kids, their first year out. Well, what they would do with them is they would put them, their dads would sit in their spots where they had set up 
and they were set up with bait and they were set and ready to go. But the kids, they would put the kids in this thick cover that was like literally with, within eyesight. So say 50 yards away and they would put them there thinking, okay, this is me, you know, who knows? He's, I can see him. He's still good. But, um, and then what would happen is, uh, those kids would always kill the, would, would kill monster deer because they would be coming through that cover outside of that bait circle. And the, the dad used to, you know, they'd be proud of them, but you could tell there was a little animosity there. You know, it's, it's funny how, um, you know, it's just kind of interesting on, on the way, especially in Michigan, like you said, with baiting. I mean, it's been baiting here forever. When I first started hunting, I started hunting with bait. I would basically, I never really had access to private land anywhere here. Um, and uh, I would drive from downstate from the Detroit area up here and I would stop and I would buy, uh, I would buy 10 bags of carrots and I would put them out at three different stand sites and I would hang stands on those three sites. I would hunt them Friday night even though I just put carrots out there for some reason, it was pointless. I mean, I just put them there, but I would sit there and I would hunt on Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday night, or Sunday morning, Sunday night. And I would go to the store Sunday night, buy 10 more bags, put them out in three different spots again. And then I would come back up the next week. And then, uh, you know, whichever ones were hit is where I would start hanging stands at and hunting. And then, you know, progressively you realize after doing it, you know, you learn that, you know what, sitting on bait in the morning is pointless. It's not going to work. You're busting them off when you come in and there's no point in being there. And so then in the mornings you start hunting more mobile and you just start hunting more natural movements and save the bait for the evening. And then I started, you know, then I started getting mad because the bigger bucks that I was seeing weren't coming into my bait as a traditional bow hunter. I couldn't get them into the bait. I would see them on the outskirts at 30 yards and stuff. So then you start hunting downwind of the bait. Then you start killing deer and it starts to get easy. Then you want to get something different. So then you give up the bait. Then you got to go through a whole learning cycle of, of how to understand natural movements and the thing that then hits me the worst hit me the hardest was I realized that I spent that first eight years of my hunting knowing nothing about hunting because all I did was sit over bait and it was like eight years that I could have been learning how to do this that I did I learned absolutely nothing it had to start back over and then I did and then I never hunted bait again and it takes you into places and things and, and learning tactics and failures and everything that you do and it takes you to a level that you know you've never been at before where you're seeing deer every single hour of the day you know anytime anywhere you want you know what they're doing you know it's a it's a it's a heck of a transition zone you know well, let's, let's, let's go back just a, just a second on that. Cause I, I mean, that is great. And I think that there was actually probably a lot of learning that, I mean, you just outlined a ton of learning when you said you didn't learn anything, but during that whole eight years, when you were, when you were hunting and you were hunting as a traditional bow hunter, um, when did you start with a, a traditional bow and what's kept you on that path? And it, it, do, it does really seem like for most traditional bow hunters, like once you switch to traditional and you get a harvest and you, you kill a deer and you, or, or whatever, then it's like, you're never going back. But when did you make that transition and, and how has it continued on? Well, mine was, uh, I told you about that first year I killed. That was with a, um, you know, that my first real bow, other than that one I got when I was 12, that was some dart and something. I don't remember what, but, uh, um, when I, when I was at that, shotgun skeet range and i saw those guys shooting those bows i went to gibraltar trade center at a for a gun and knife show there and they had a compound bow and it was a golden eagle uh had the overdraw systems on it where you were <laughs> shooting like short little arrows and um i i didn't even have the money to buy it so i had to call my mom um you know i was 19 and uh i had to call my mom and she forwarded over her credit card information to the guy so i could buy that bow um and i got that bow and then that, and that was in september and on October 3rd, I killed my first deer with it. Um, and then I sold it. And as soon as I killed that deer, I was like, well, this is easy. Holy cow, this is my first time. Loving it. I mean, I sat last night this morning. This is this is pretty easy. And I said, let's, I, you know what, I want to, I got to, now I killed a deer. I got to be more professional about this here. So I sold that Golden Eagle bow and I bought a Br Browning Ballistic Mirage, which was the fastest bow at the time. Um, and I bought it and it fell apart. This, uh, I had to, in a, in a span of like a month and a half, the limbs, uh, I had two cracked limbs on there that came apart. Um, and they, they fixed them very quickly for warranty. First time it happened, they just gave me a brand new bow. Second time it happened, I didn't realize till I was already done with it, but I couldn't keep a group with that bow to save my life and everything was vibrating loose. My sight pins would come off. I never even hunted during the whole rest of October or all of November, um, because that bow had given me so many problems. And finally I said, you know what? I was, I was in a gander mountain 
And uh, I, I walked into a Mountain and I saw a recurse hanging on the wall. And I said, hey, can I try one of those? It was right-handed. I'm left-handed. Um, but uh, actually, I shot. I take that back. It was, uh, it was right-handed. And I shot a compound right-handed. But I am left-handed, left-eye dominant. But I, I golf right-handed. I swing a bat right-handed. Um, so I shot a, bow, a compound right-handed. Well, I picked up that bow and I shot it into that recurve in their test range. And I, I fell in love with it. It was a Martin Mamba recurve. Um, and I loved it a lot. And this was, like I said, this is literally, you know, this is six weeks after I killed that first year. <laughs> and uh, I told him, I, and the guy behind the counter said he did my eye test on there because I told him I'm left-handed, but I shoot right-handed. And he said, I'm left-eye dominant. If I'm going to shoot traditional, I'm going to want to get a left-handed bow. I said, you know what, I'm going to do this anyway. So I ordered one. I special ordered it and showed up a week later, um, came right to the store, and I went and picked it up. And then uh, that was it. I, I took it to the range, and I shot it till my arm fell off. And I did the next thing for three days again. And I thought, you know what, at 10 yards, I'm, I'm wicked deadly with this thing. I'm going hunting with it. And I managed to make it up and hunt for the last two days of the season. And uh, I did miss uh, I missed one doe that last, very last day of the season that year with it shot just under it. You know, but it was the most powerful thing I'd ever experienced, and that set the stone. And then from there, it was I bought a few more bows, and I shot every 3D tournament. I won a lot of awards for them and plaques, and I, I worked real hard that year. And then it took me three years. I shot over the back of 12 deer from tree stands over the next three years before I finally connected on one with a, with a traditional bow. And that was in uh, 97 was when I killed my first deer with a, with a recurve. That was with a uh, Brackenberry recurve. And, and that was it. And that just like that set the stone. And, um, and I just, you know, I love the fact that there's, there's, there's nothing that can go wrong with it, especially like a long bowl, like I'm using there, there is no twisted limbs. There is no failures. There is nothing that goes wrong. No sight pins to get loose, no release to lose. There's just, no, it is nothing that can go wrong. I don't have to hold it level. I can be on my belly in the middle of a field and then have deer walk by, um, which I did one time in, in Port Huron state game area. It was pretty awesome. But I, I had deer that were feeding in this field all the time out there in this public land field. I went out there earlier in the, in the uh, day and I laid down by this little two foot tall rock and I laid flat on my stomach and I waited and sure enough, those deer came out. And all I had to do was just flex my stomach muscles to lift my chest off the ground far enough to draw a bit anchor. And I ended up killing one of those does. Um, you know, it's what you could do with it. It was kind of the, for me, the ultimate hunting weapon. And, uh, but it also traditional archery leads you down a path of, uh, you know, uh, like you were saying, John, where you want to make all your own stuff. You want to tinker with this stuff on your own, build your own strings, make your own arrows, make things your way. Um, that draws you in. There's the romance behind it. Fred bear, Howard Hill, eyes in the and even the people here that you learn like the animals that you, you you learn from and what their accomplishments are and you know there's that whole romance behind it that draws you in and then on top of that the other thing that really is a big uh, draw for everybody is you can never beat it okay you can never be you can never be as good as you're going to get you know there is no point where you hit where you're you can it you know 30 yards or even 20 yards where you can be touching feathers every single time you shoot there, there is just no way to out shoot it or to be better than it can be. You can't, you cannot hit a ceiling on there. You know, you, you don't get to be that good. And then when you're in the woods hunting with it, it's a whole nother level because your game is so tight. You know, for us as a traditional guy, I mean, your hunt is over before we even think about taking the bow off the rack, you know, off the hook. It doesn't, you know, everything is so tight and so close and so intimate but there's a real draw to that. So it's a, it's a major power, you know, to it. Is, is it ups and downs? Yeah. And I'm not going to lie. Every single bow that I own, except for this last one, and that's because I've only used it for one season, but every other bow I've owned, I've flung it out of trees three or four times, <laughs> maybe, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> it, it can be a love hate relationship. You know, I mean, I have, I have missed more big deer than most people could ever dream about. And I'm not kidding. You know, it's, <laughs> it's you know, it's because it, there's no sight. It's all hundred percent mental. There is no sight pin. There is no release. There's no let off. There's no wall. There's no, no, any of that stuff. It's all 100% mental. And uh, when you put that into the game and then you start throwing in buck fever or all these other things that come into play, um, it's mental overload. And, you know, I watch some of the best people in the world miss by 10, 12 feet on an eight yard shot. You know, it, it happens. <laughs> so uh, I just want to throw this over there to John, because I feel like you're, you're speaking his language. Our, our last, uh, guest you know jim the traditional bow hunter you know john said that's why he's afraid to go down that path because he thinks he'll 
just go right to it. But when you talk about throwing your bow, I mean, John's got a Q-tip and he's cleaning his RX-1 and, uh, that bow is taking a, a dirt bath here, here or there. I mean, you're, you're, <laughs> you're speaking his language. So it almost took a big, uh, <laughs> a big fling up at Boyne Mountain when I first got it. It was brand new and I was having some issues with my release and I almost ground tuned it, you know, pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> ground tuned it. I love yeah. It. Yep. I got a buddy, John Tucker from Tactus Saddle, and he, I hunt with him all the time. And he's funny because, um, you know, with me, like I said, when I throw a bow, I throw it like I mean it. I mean, it takes me a little <laughs> while to find it again. I mean, I'm pissed, you know. And um, But him, he's so funny because he'll try to do the same thing. Like, even when we're on 3D shoots and he's up there in the tower and he takes a shot and he misses and he gets mad, like, he'll act like he's going to throw it. But really, you can see his eyes looking for a bush that it'll land in us. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like, come on, you baby. Just throw it like a man. <laughs> Oh, so being a, a a traditional hunter and having to be that close, um, and and being in proximity to with with all of these deer, um, that takes. I mean, even for us, I mean, I can't say that I've, I said you know my my success this year has been uh, being close enough to these racked bucks to to have an opportunities at them, um. And I, that's something that I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, you know, you have a, a course on, you know, for bow hunting and, and getting better and, and everything like that. And we can talk about that a little bit later, but as far as like getting in and, and figuring out these, these properties and having learned after hunting from bait, which, you know, for, for most of our listeners, I think kind of started out that way or, or, you know, kind of trying to every gimmick under the sun to try and try and make it easier that if I buy this, it'll make it better. If I put bait out, it'll make it better. If I do this, it'll make it better. Um, you know, how do you, um, approach a hunt? Cause you hunt Missouri, Kansas, Georgia, you know, Michigan. Um, how are you approaching these hunts? What, where do you start, um, as far as, uh, like is it terrain features is it pressure is it and then you know because like i say or as you had said i guess you know our hunt's done before you pick up the bow and it's hard as hell for us to get in on good deer and everything so you know what's the secret jason what's what's the magic (laughs) <laughs> well, it is definitely systematic to get it rolling, you know, to get to get into there. But, um, you know, one thing that us traditional guys, we get laughed at by anybody that's a compound guy or a crossbow guy that hunts with a traditional bow hunter knows exactly what I'm talking about. But a traditional bow hunter, when he picks the spot he wants to go, and he's like, oh, right here, look at I got this intersection, that rub, this scrape, this is where I need to be at. A modern hunter will then be up a tree five minutes later ready to go settled in. A traditional bow hunter will sit there for 40 minutes staring at the trees going this tree or that tree maybe that tree don't this tree wait should i get in this tree and they'll stand there for 40 minutes trying to decide what tree in a five yard area that they have to go in and that is crucial because again if we're off by five yards we may not get that shot i mean i've had over a hundred bucks this year that were inside of 30 yards between all my hunting over a hundred of them and i only took two of them home because of that distance, you know, can't because of not being able to be off by five yards, you know. So that's a pretty important thing for us. And it's so, so you're right. It is, you know, trying to, and it's not just traditional hunters, even if it's a compound shooter that's having a bad day um, and he doesn't trust his shooting and he's like, okay, I'm going to keep it under 20 yards because I'm not feeling confident at 30. Um, he's going to have the same kind of thing, you know, same kind of things to go after. But, you re- it's really critical that you get right into that spot. And you, as a traditional bow hunter, you learn that early on that, you know, it, you don't get any points for a deer that walks by you at 30 yards. Cause most of us are trying to be most people under 25, me under 20. I don't like shooting further than 20. Um, I can count on one hand, how many deer I've killed past 20 and it's been like 22, 23, you know, that kind of thing. And I, I'm much happier at 12 and eight and nine. Um, so for us to be able to set up like that, it, it, it takes a lot more to it. But it all starts in the beginning. There's two two methods. One is your home state, okay? That's one. And the other one is the out of state. Now, at your home state where you can scout it, um, that's good to do. But in today's society, 
the old methods of where you just basically park the truck and hike and learn and read topo maps and stuff like that out there and try to learn it uh, and put, you know, burn shoe leather, those days are gone. We have too much technology available to us. So even at home, your scouting starts with cyber scouting. Pick the, if you're on public land or even on private land, but on private, you're going to learn it real fast, but it'll also show you what's going on on your neighboring properties. Um, You can even see the deer trails on this stuff, you know, on Google Earth and stuff like that. So you start with cyber scouting the area, you find, and I am 100% a terrain feature hunter. That is the mandatory thing for me. I don't hunt deer. I hunt terrain and I hunt the wind and let the deer be there. Um, because we have to, again, as a traditional bow hunter, I, I can't take a funnel that's a hundred yards wide, set up in the middle, middle of it and shoot 50 yards on either side. I don't have that luxury. I need to narrow that hundred yards down to a 40 yard, you know, where I can have 20 on one side, 20 on the other. Um, you know, that kind of a thing. So it gets very hard to do that um, in certain things. So the terrain features, and when I say terrain features, I mean a blow down tree. That's a terrain feature to me. I may not see that on Google Earth. Sometimes I do, but if I if I get into a 100-yard funnel and I'm set up, I want to get in there, I'm paying attention and even using my binoculars and scanning. And Oh, look, it, there's a down tree top right there. If there's a tree connected to that by the way it is, that's going to cut off 20 yards or 15 yards of that. That's going to narrow that for me. You know, and you start looking for all these things that are going to make those deer come by you at 20 yards. Um, so you start it with cyber scouting, find the natural funnels, the terrain features that are going to channel those deer. Then you start moving in on those, and when you get into them, You can start figuring out and finding what these things are that are going to narrow it down even more. And then you figure out what the wind's going to do and when you can be there. And then you set up and start hunting them. Now for your out of state stuff, um, this may sound horrible because it's in, but I'm not going to lie. I'll be hundred percent honest. I have never once in my entire life ever scouted an out of state hunt. Um, I have on the computer and I find these spots cyber scouting. And I, I mark up maps on based on good terrain features and things like that. But I, I you know, if we pull into camp and it's uh, three o'clock in the morning, if I pull into camp, I'm sent in a, even in a place I've never been. I'm setting up camp real quick, and before daylight, I'm going to be in the woods, heading to one of those spots I have marked on the map. I'll go in blind in the morning, and I'll wait for that light just to get a little gray light if I need it, or if not, if my headlamp will suffice, I'll figure it out and I'll be up in a tree before daylight. Um, and I'll hunt it and then I'll sit and I'll stay there until two, two o'clock in the afternoon. And then I'll get down and I'll move to another spot quickly and scout on the fly as I'm going real fast. But if I go to that spot, it looks like I want, I shoot up that tree and I'll sit there for the last, uh, you know, two and a half hours of the evening, get down. And then uh, I do the same thing the next day. I, when I get back to camp, I sit in my tent in my sleeping bag and uh, I'm in one side. And whoever's with me is on his cot and his sleeping bag and we're staring at our phones looking at the property on, on cyber scouting and going on. And then literally an hour later, it'll be dead quiet. And I'll say, okay, I'm going here tomorrow. It's like, all right, I think I found where I'm going to in the morning. We leave at four o'clock in the morning, get out there before daylight, get set up and hunt it. If I don't like where I am, when the sun comes up, I'll yank everything down and move it over. And so when you're, you're going in there at gray light and, uh, not not going in a gray light. Uh, yeah, I'm there before, but waiting to climb up till gray light. Sometimes, if I need to see. Right. What is it that you're looking for? What makes that that determination for you? I think like the the the, the minutia and the the like the, all this like nuance stuff, and that's kind of like we, what we talked to, uh, with with Dan Infault was like when. Yeah, everybody knows, oh, we'll look for rubs and we'll look for scrapes and we'll look for, you know, like you said, funnels or, or, you know, deer trails or big tracks, you know, but what, when you get to that spot in that, you know, witching hour or whatever, when you're, when you're sitting there and and the sky starts to, you know, create that silhouette or whatever, you know, what is it that you're looking for that's telling you, okay, this is it or this isn't it? All I need to know is I need to see fresh deer sign, fresh tracks, fresh whatever. Um, Keep in mind, I'm not a trophy hunter, so I'm not looking for for monster deer. Um, But what I am looking for, I I already know exactly what the deer are doing there because cyber scouting showed me that. I mean, the reason I'm there is because I know where I know where point A is, I know where point B is, and I know that the terrain's going to tell them they got to come through here. Um, now I want to go there and verify that yes, they're still using this spot. It hasn't been blown out 
somebody didn't come in here and hunt it and ruin it. If I have fresh sign there, fresh deer tracks, some good trails and that kind of stuff, which I can usually see by my headlamp, uh, I'm good to go. Usually the only reason I'm waiting till gray light is because it's, it's so thick that I can't distinguish from the ground. I cannot pick shooting lanes because your light reflects off of the little branches and I can't actually see good enough to pick out where I could get the best shooting from. And I do not want to walk on any of this sign um, and screw it up if I have to move over. Now, once that sky just starts to go to a to a dark blue instead of being a black, um, those trees silhouette enough that you can actually see, and I can see that good enough to go, oh, right there, is good. that tree is going to give me the best one, and then I'm not afraid to walk over there. You know, but I mean, I'll get in there and stand there again, half hour, 40 minutes before daylight, and if I could get in based on what my headlamp will let me see, I do. Um, or I, if I'm really want to get up, then I'll climb to, I'll climb to shooting lanes is what I call it. Climb to shooting, but I'll start climbing that tree. And as I'm climbing, I'm using my headlamp full power, 800 lumens. And I am looking for shooting lanes as I'm climbing. And if I, sometimes I go too high and it's like, no, I got to back down a stick. Um, cause I need to be where I can shoot and I end up eight feet in a tree, but it is what it is. Um, that you got to do whatever you got to do to get that shooting, you know, cause you've never been there before. And it's not like you can be making much noise, you know? So, but it's the, it's, as long as there's fresh shine there, I'm happy because I already know it. Now, fresh shine for me, mainly deer tracks and trails and fresh shine on the trails. Um, rubs and scrapes, I, I honestly don't care uh, because of the fact that I've never killed a deer that was ever making a rub and I never killed a deer standing on a scrape. I've seen them do it before, but I've never killed one there. Um, and I have hunted scrapes quite a bit in my early days and I never had one come to a scrape. So during that time. So I don't care about that. All that is is reinforcement that there's bucks that are used in the area. And I do like to know that, but as far as uh, I'm hunting the terrain feature, so whether it's a doe or buck, it doesn't matter. They need to come through this area in order to get from A to B. And so when you're talking about terrain features, what are you gravitating towards, uh, whether it's uh, as a traditional hunter or just in general for deer movement? Oh, they're so microscopic. It's, um, you know, that's that's my strong point. That's my ace in the hole is, um, again, you can take a 100-yard funnel. You can take a hillside that's got a huge, you know, private land field. Even on state land, some of them are like this, where it's a hillside that's all heavily wooded. Then you got a private land field that's uh, open pasture on top, so you know they're not going to go there. You got a river down below, so you know you're not. They're not. They're going to be somewhere between the river and that hillside. Let's say that it's uh, 400 yards from top to bottom, and now and deer can be anywhere on there. Well, learning how to understand and identify a bench on a topo map is a gold mine. Um, learning how to understand that there might be a bench here. Um, and then, or, or walking it somewhere that, you know, walking that in and coming in by the river or coming in up on the top edge of that private property. So you get to an area, you think's good and drop it into it. Um, but then, you know, so that you can find like that bench or that something, uh, I'm a huge fan of micro transition lines. These are, um, when a tree falls in the woods, it creates a spot for wind to then come through. Then as that wind comes through, that wind hits another and it hits another tree that's not used to getting that much wind, and it will eventually topple that tree over too. It's almost kind of like a domino effect that happens uh, because you create these wind tunnels and they start knocking trees over. Well, when those trees fall, light now hits the ground in those areas, and they bring up a lot of underbrush. That underbrush may be 10 yards wide, uh, a strip through there, and it may not go the whole way. And then maybe maybe it goes for 40 yards, and then after 40 yards, it ends up moving up the hill uh, 30 yards, and it happened over there where another tree went down, you know, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, and it creates that same exact effect. But there are these micro transitions of thicker stuff along the routes here, and those bucks will use that stuff. They, they know where it is, um, and they use it to their advantage. And finding that kind of stuff, being able to identify where that is and know that, yes, you got four good trails out here, and these are probably does and, and immature deer, but this edge right here, this little strip right here, if there's a bigger buck coming through here, he will use this cover. And then understanding where that, you know, those are what I call those micro transitions and micro funnels. So you take a 400-yard wide funnel, you just narrowed it down to 10 yards, you know, that kind of thing. You know, and that's one of the things where I love what we get to do here on this podcast because – like I was telling you before we started, it's like I only talk to people that really that I want to talk to. Um, you know, it's not for um, the podcast so much as it is for the listener and 
I put myself as a listener because I'm, you know, just facilitating this, but I, it's, it's very self-serving, but I can think back on times where exactly what you outlined. And I kind of laugh there because there's a spot where John hunts. That's exactly what you just outlined, except for it's a Creek. It's not a, it's not a river, but there's farm fields up top and it's maybe 400 yards of, of, of woods. And then there's another spot like, right. We've got a cabin up in Baldwin where I, I scouted this spot with, with Frank and I found these down trees and there's a spot where the bucks are right down in the middle of it. And like, I can picture it in my head, like exactly the route that they're using. And it's because of those down trees, but it doesn't ever it, it, like it, kind of like we, we, we talked about with somebody actually sh- teaching you or showing you or, or, or figuring out on your own. Um, you know, I've never, I, this year I didn't have a chance to go in and hunt there, but that's the spot that I want to hunt just to, to watch the movement. But you explaining it like that, like in, with a lot of these podcasts is I listen to things and I think back to like all the times where things have happened or why it, why it's happened, you know, and, uh, you know, John raises his eyebrows anytime we hear the, the word bench, because I mean, this spot that we hunted in Ohio, there was this, this bench and that's all we heard for two years about, about hunting there. I mean, the bench, the bench, the bench, the bench. The bench. <laughs> So it's really Benches are amazing. Yeah. But, it, but any, it's, it's a, it's a funneling, you know, a deer is going to take, I, I hate when I hear people say the deer, a deer is going to take the path of least resistance. You know what? No, they're not. I promise you. Uh, well, no, I take that back. When you're talking about bigger bucks, they don't take the path of least resistance. They take the path of least resistance. It gives them security. That's the key. And when you use that to your knowledge, like I said, a funnel may be a funnel, but when you use the micro, all these little things, it will microscopically move that deer subconsciously. He doesn't even know he's doing it, but it's just his, his will to survive that will naturally channel him to these places. That's what separates, you know, um, you know, what, what it takes for a traditional bow hunter. Cause again, we can't shoot, you know, we don't, if, if, if that deer walks by us at 30 yards, all we do is just sit there and look at it through our binoculars and watch it and enjoy it. But we don't even pull a bow off the hook. It, it's just so interesting. Like I said, because for, like I say, myself, as much as a listener, you know, I try to give the listener the best experience as far as like learning. And for me, it's always like, I just, I mean, when you talk about bedded bucks, when you talk about deer using these transitions when you talk about any of that stuff it always goes back to like experiences that i've had and i've never been able to put the put two and two together but then when somebody says it or articulates it or uses that on a regular basis it's like oh that's what's happening you know that that's what's happening and so with those micro terrain features and that sort of stuff are you able to see that sort of thing from Google Maps or um, now you I, I've heard you talk about using a GPS or having a GPS as a backup. Are you using any of the online tools like Onyx or, or anything like that? I don't use any of those. Now I've heard great things about Onyx. Um, and I was pretty excited about it, honestly, to, uh, and this might've been user error, but, uh, you know, John's been using it. He used it all this year and he was the whole way down to Kansas. He was talking about how much he loved it, but I'm not going to lie. There were two times that I watched him pop out to a river in Kansas when I was canoeing. I'm like, dude, what are you doing there? He's like trying to find my freaking boat. You know, it's like, uh, it's about 150 yards down to your right, man. <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, and he was using it. So it's, it's definitely not bad, but I guess you don't get like a breadcrumb trail in there, or maybe he didn't know how to use it. Um, where that's the thing I like about my GPS is it works everywhere. And I know these ones do with your phone too. So I'm not knocking them, but understand I have zero experience with them. But for me, my GPS in, in 20 years of using them has never let me down. And it shows me my breadcrumb trail, which to me is vitally important for trail and deer and vitally important for me. If I want, if I leave a stand up, like I, let's say I go in and blind in the afternoon, which I do all the time. And I go in and I set up in a spot. I'm not paying attention to where I am or what I'm doing. I know where my truck is. I know where I'm heading to. But then when I get up there in that stand and I hunt it, if I really like it, 
then when I leave, I don't want to set that area up. So then I can pull out my GPS, which has been on, but it shows me my exact trail where I walked, and I can walk that exact same route out so that I don't have multiple footsteps and multiple scents, and I'm not walking over different deer trails. I follow the same exact route that I came in. I go exactly out, and then when I come in the next morning, I put my feet in the same exact spots again. So there is only one specific trail to my second hunt there, um, where if you didn't do that, then you end up with three different trails. You're one in, you're one out, you're one back in. Right. Yeah. You that, know, so for me, that's an advantage. There, Onyx does have like your, you set, you turn your tracker on when you start and then you can, it'll leave a breadcrumb trail for you and you can zoom okay. in, zoom out. And leave, nice. Leave yep. See, he may not have, yeah, he might not have done, he does the waypoints and he does all that stuff. And like I said, I know a lot of people that use it and love it. But whatever, what my advice is, whatever you use, whether it's GPS or OnX or Backcountry Navigator or any of these apps and stuff that are out there, make sure it's got some kind of a track motor or breadcrumb trail because that is, uh, especially when tracking animals. You know, if oh. you can't grid where you've been, then you're wasting your time, you know. Absolutely, yeah. And, but are you able to see those, like, micro transitions or are you just looking for the 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 benches in, in that terrain feature? And then you're using the, I guess where you're talking about the down trees and the wind, wind tunnels and, and things like that once you get in there. Yeah, it's, it's a series of nesting dolls is how I usually refer to it on my podcast. But the first nesting doll is get online or on your maps, find what you can. It looks like a, a terrain feature. Then you open the next nesting doll is where you're zooming in closer and you're looking for any features that are there that are going to give you anything. Next nesting doll is hitting that history feature on there so you can look at previous maps and maybe find one in the spring or winter so you can see and identify any down trees uh, or you can identify anything that might be a micro transition in there. And then, uh, then the next nesting doll is heading in there when you get there and you know you're 10 yards from where you think you want to be in the mornings or you know in the afternoon it's easy but in the mornings turn that light on full power step up on top of a stump or even grab a hold of a branch that you can pull yourself up you know three feet in a tree and kind of look in to see if you're seeing anything there or anything that's going to help again narrow that down walk a little closer if you have to but when you walk out there Make sure before you walk out where, there, where deer are going to be traveling through, you give yourself a backup plan, meaning that if I don't find what I want where I think I'm going to out there 15 yards in front of me, I need to know that this tree right here can give me one that's going to shoot right over my path where I just walked at. Because if you're going to walk across deer traffic where you want to kill them at, you better walk right where you expect to shoot them broadside at. Because if you walk uh, 10 yards to the left of that and they're coming at you, you're going to get a quarrying two shot and you can't take it. They're going to bust you when they hit your scent. Um, you know, so you want it where they're going to, you want to be able to shoot your scent line if you're crossing over deer sign. Um, so it, being, doing this stuff in the morning, trying to find those micro transitions are tricky. And uh, a lot of times I'm hitting that funnel and I am edging that funnel. Like I said, almost like a, like a beagle peeking over top of, you know, CRP fields, trying to see what's out there. You know, you're, you're po poking your head as high as you can and you're trying to look for something that gives you one more nesting doll. And uh, when you get that one, you move into that area. And when you get there, you're looking for one more nesting doll, whether it's a tree with better cover um, or something like that, or like you said, a blowdown, or, you know, you're looking, you're just, you're trying to get as many of those nesting dolls opened as you can. Cause if you get them all open, it's a, it's a, it's a for sure deal. If you get, you know, six out of 10, that's acceptable. You get eight out of 10, that's fantastic. You get four out of 10, you know what? It's daylight. You get up there anyway. <laughs> you know? Right. No. I mean, especially with you being a traditional hunter, you got to get them in close. And you're talking about your scent and stuff. Do you take extra measures like ozone, you know, generators and all this stuff or uh, scent eliminators, scent blockers? Do you use any of that to? Uh, no, I don't use anything. I don't use anything at all. And I don't even have, uh, the only thing I do is I have scent free soap, the green stuff. I use that when I'm in a shower. Um, and then I use like a, uh, whatever one's on sale, whether it's dead downwind or whatever, but I use whatever uh, laundry detergent I buy at the end of the year, I buy like two or three of them. Yep. And, uh, and it's what I use. But other than that, I, I haven't even used like a scent spray, scent killer spray in forever. And yes, I am the guy that will literally stop at the gas station and fill my truck up in the morning and walk through, you know, kitty litter oil stains and <laughs> all that stuff that's down there in the, in the parking lot, get back in my truck and head right out the woods. I don't change clothes. I don't nothing. Um, actually a lot of my hunts where I only get like an hour or hour and a half 
which are often midday, which is going to surprise a lot of you guys. But, uh, um, you know, I can be in here working and I got meetings in the morning and then meetings in the evening and I can get out from like uh, from 12 to two. I can I, I have free and I will literally in my jeans that I'm wearing in my shoots and my the exact clothes I'm wearing, I will grab my pack and my bow and a, and a, and a flannel shirt just to throw on. And I will jump in my car, head out there with my stand, go shoot up in a tree and I'll have about 45 minutes to hunt and I'll kill a deer in that outfit, you know, wearing exactly what I just wore to work. I'll drag that deer out, come back home and make it to my meetings, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I used to, uh, you know, as a younger adult, I would, you know, I had a, a tote and I'd have everything sent free washed and, you know, spray everything down. And then, you know, I got to the point where, you know, like they've done the studies and stuff with the dogs and, or little, you know, scenarios where it's like, really it's, you're wasting, it's a, it's a sales pitch to me, <laughs> you know, you yep. got to play the wind right. And you're never going to get rid, rid of all your scent. I mean, yeah, I could see to a point where you could, eliminate some and that might give you a, a split second or you know or, or two to get that shot off before the deer you know really bust you but it's just i mean it's 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 cool to hear it from you especially being a traditional hunter where you you got you're getting them in like you said your average is like nine yards so i mean that's close <laughs> yeah and I, here's the way i put scent control um, first of all, the funniest thing he actually said by Dan Info, the best way I ever heard it put is he says, if, if scent lock and that stuff works so good, how come when my buddy in the car wearing it farts, I still smell it. Exactly. You know? um, but, uh, um, but I do say, here's, here's my advice to anybody that's getting into this. You can take scent control as far as you want, even to like John Eberhardt and his level that it does, and that's all okay. The only thing that you just don't let it affect your hunting. What I mean by that is if you're worried about not going out today because it's only going to be able to sit out there for an hour and you don't want to get your clothes dirty and have to wash them again, then you've got a problem with scent control because now it's interfering with you being able to spend time in the woods. Um, you know, that kind of thing. If you're not going to um, go out because of the fact that you don't want to take your bow out there um, in the rain because it's going to wash off any of this scent wax or anything you put on there, then it's affecting your hunting and it's a problem. So take it to whatever level you want, but the day, when the day gets there, they, you're not going to go because it's too much of a pain in the butt to take everything out of that tote and then you got to reactivate it in a dryer and do all this. So you're going to say, I'm not going today whenever you say that you've got a problem with scent control so do whatever you want with it but don't let it interfere with your hunting if it gets that far stop it right yeah i, I mean i at one point cared about that and it, you know my my mom actually went to high school with the inventor of scent lock and uh, he's right here from muskegon and um, I don't know that he still lives here. I know he sold the company and it's part of one of the groups now, but I owned one of the first suits and the green uh, ones. Yep. Yep. I had, I bought it out of his basement. As a matter of fact, they were wow. on, on galvanized shelves in his basement. Um, but right now I hunt in a set of scent lock full season bibs that I haven't washed in probably three years, but they're quiet and they're warm. And that's yep. the one thing. But with the scent control, I think that if it's something that gives you confidence, I think that that's one of the things that we learned from the Western hunters and the, the elk hunters and the Dan Infaults. And, you know, you have to have confidence going out there and saying, like, today's the day that I'm going to kill something. If you go out there and say, well, I'm not going to kill anything. I'm just going to be out here. Well, then that's what's going to happen. So if it's got enough confidence to get you in the woods, then I think it's a good thing. Um but I'll just give Jason a plug right here. He has probably the best, coolest, most awesome Buck the Industry podcast that I've ever heard of 10 things that you should buy and 10 things that you shouldn't buy. Um, that is probably one of the best podcasts that I've ever listened to. And if you haven't listened to one of Jason's podcasts, I don't know the way that he actually does a podcast but this is what i picture is him driving down the road talking to himself and so we've <laughs> done we've done you know you know almost 90 podcasts now with guests and just talking john and i and uh that has to be one of the most difficult things to do i would think am i correct in that assessment <laughs> 
You are. And, you know, but you, you've made two things. One, you said it before we even started recording. And then you said it again once we started recording. And uh, you said that you're doing this podcast to help people out there. And, see, that's the key. That, And you also said earlier that you had no interest in being famous in this kind of stuff. And you were talking about this. And, you know, that that's what we do this for. And that's what makes it easy to do is because we we're, we're, there's we get no benefit from this. We don't make a lot of money from it. Actually, I my podcast I don't make any money from. I do from my, some of my YouTube videos and stuff. But, um, but we do it because we want want to help other people when you get to a certain level of being able to do something when you're good at it it's only natural to want to educate and help other people achieve their goals as well too that's the reason you have this podcast that's the reason i have my podcast and when you you come at it with that approach of that way to do it like you're looking at it going okay who can we get on that will help our guests and the people or the help will help our listeners and who are you know who can we have that people will benefit from that's what you're aiming for for me when i get in the car i'm going what is a question that somebody's you know asking and wishes they had an answer for that i can help them with and then i create that i'm almost basically making a person up in my mind and i'm talking to him like i could help him with that situation and that's what i'm trying to do and then i just talk to him just like we are right now but it's just me in my truck at you know two o'clock in the morning driving from detroit back home <laughs> yeah and like like i said like when you when john asked the question about the scent control i was like john this guy doesn't even wear a camel like he, he, no, I don't. <laughs> he's like, I don't even own any camo, and yeah, and and that was you know you hadn't listened to it. You said that's what on your list, but with Joe Rentmeister, he says, oh, well, I was like, did you specifically wear your work clothes because you were in camp with the scent lock aficionado? And he said, no, I'm cheap, and I only own two sets of camo, and they were both wet because it was raining the whole time. Yep. <laughs> and, but that didn't stop him from hunting. And that, like I say, that, that, like I said, if, for our listeners, like uh, Jason probably doesn't even know the number of the podcast, but there's a podcast out there that says the 10 things that you should buy and the 10 things that you shouldn't buy. And it's like, I remember I recorded it. It was only about probably four or five months ago. So it, it's got to be within the last probably 50 of them or something. Yeah. But it, I mean, it, it is exactly like to the core of what we're trying to do here is like, John's in a conundrum right now. He may find himself with a a, a long bow or a recurve or something like that because John Dudley's just left Hoyt, and so he's going to have to switch his bow setup up. But no, I no. To be <laughs> honest with you, I had actually been uh, texting back and forth with uh, with Pat, our buddy Pat, over in Cedar or Cedar Springs here back in early December. I was like. You know, last year I shot the the Matthews um, verdicts at ATA, and I was like, man. And I, we, we mentioned it, the verdicts and the Bowtech, and they both shot really good. I mean, and for the price comparison to the, the Hoyt, the Carbon Hoyts, like, man. You know, and then especially this year, the RX-4, I was just up at the pro shop today, and, you know, the list on that is 1700 bucks. And it's like, yeah. how can you... You know, sitting there talking to one of the guys in the shop, it's like, man, how can you really justify a bow for seventeen hundred dollars? And then, in next season, it won't even be worth half of that. For, I mean, pretty much they 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 depreciate so fast. Where I'm like, you can, I have a shotgun, a Benelli shotgun that I bought, you know, fifteen twenty years ago, and it's pretty much still worth the same amount of money, if not more. But and what you paid for it, yep. yeah. But so. That was, you know, I'm like, but anyway, I was talking to Pat or I was texting him and I'm like, man, if the VXR is as good as, if, it, if it's better than the Vertex, I might be retooling this year. And, you know, it kind of, I'm like, I am a big John Dudley fan, huge John Dudley fan. And I, I shoot Hoyt. And then all of a sudden the other night when I read his, you know, message on Instagram and I listened to his podcast and he talked about how he's leaving Hoyt, but he hasn't announced who he's going to. I'm like, well, <laughs> it's, the, it's my opportunity now. I mean, I can switch to Hoyt and not feel, or switch to Matthews and not feel bad, but maybe yeah. he's going there, or maybe but, he's not. But but what I was saying is, <laughs> is 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 with that is like you know that's what we try to talk about on the podcast is like not being brand specific, yeah. and just you know just hunting and enjoying the experience, kind of what you know coming full circle, kind of what we were talking about at the beginning is just enjoying 
sharing it with somebody. Like I said, like I killed a a spike with brow tines this year. I killed them on video and it was amazing because I get to share it with all my family and and even you know with with Frank missing that buck two times in one day, I get to share that with our family and, and us missing turkeys this year. I mean, <laughs> we had the most epic turkey season ever as far as never having it work out perfectly. And with shotguns, we'd have killed every single one of these turkeys. Oh yeah. And we just yep. screwed it up so bad. I mean, my, I, so my father-in-law, Frank, I looked it up, uh, 1985, him and his buddy killed the state record Turkey in 1985. And looking at, the weights, the beards, everything. That turkey that he missed was top 10 in the state with a bow. And it was probably the state record turkey just because it makes it a much better story. <laughs> um, so he missed the state record turkey with a bow. And we got that on video. He missed a, <laughs> a booner in Nebraska um, and an outfitter on like their retirement you know, hunt. And then he missed that one twice on video and having it on video, both the Turkey and this one is just so much better, not because to rub it in, but to say exactly what happened. Like I can tell you a hundred times, you can't believe what happened, but when you see it, you're like, Oh my God, you're sitting right there going, could just shoot him, just shoot him. Knock and, another arrow. And man, yeah. it's just been it's just been so fun this season, you know, <laughs> and and you learn so much and you gain so much from it. And you, even the failures and the misses, I mean, still you did everything right. And you got to do it again. You know, all <laughs> it means when you connect is that you got work to do and you're going to get some food in your freezer, but everything else is the same. And then there's, you know, you also have so much of the fun stuff that happens when you're in the woods too. And now some of that you catch on camera, probably some of it you don't, but I mean, there's so many times that you just, you know, you just basically sit down in the dark and laugh at yourself because you did the dumbest thing you could ever imagine. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I was actually, um, two of them, I took my daughter out, we were scouting and, uh, this was about probably six years ago and we were scouting on public land and we were driving through there and I saw this big buck, you know, cross this power line and I'm like going, Oh, Hey, let's get out and see where he went. I want to figure this out here. Um, and go. So we started walking in there. And uh, so we start following this deer and we're, we're following this, this sign and I'm looking at everything and I'm, I'm, I can't find a deer anymore, but I'm following, I know what he's doing and the terrain's telling me and I get there and I'm like, this is where the spot is right here. And, and Bella goes, look, there's a tree stand right there. I'm like, what? I look up there, I'm like, gosh darn it, somebody's in here. I'm like, but man, look, Bella, he is set up right. Look, he's got the right angle for this, and uh, he's set at the right height. He's got the cover. That's a gorilla stand, too. That's the same kind of thing we do. And notice how he's left hit. And I went, you know what? Hang on. And I'm like, Bella, that's, that's my stand. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I walk over, and she's like, no. I'm like, listen. Pull out my binoculars, walk over there and look at the bottom. You'll see my name written on the bottom of it, on, on the frame. Sure enough. And I'm like, I can't believe it. I wondered where I left that, you know. And uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then another time, actually, last year, I went to a stand that I hadn't been in forever. Um, you know, it was I actually, I don't leave stands up. So there's no stand there, but I must have hunted this tree one time a long time ago. But I knew I'd been in the area before. Well, I went there in the, in the afternoon. I climb up this tree. And it's this big oak tree, and I climb up in there, and I get settled in. I end up seeing five or six does come through there, and I ain't getting any shots or nothing. But as I'm coming down, I got my headlamp on. I get down. I drop my uh, stand on the ground. I'm getting ready to pull my last stick off the tree. Well, when I pulled my last stick off, right behind the strap, there were two bright eyes that I must have left in there side by side from way back in the day. But anyway, when I yank the strap off, all of a sudden these two eyeballs open up and stare in my face from this, these two bright eyes in my headlamp. Scared the crap out of me so bad I took like three steps back, tripped over my tree stand in my pack, landed on my face, and then that stick came down and landed right on top of me. But I was scared. <laughs> I thought those two bright eyes were something staring at me right in front of my face when I dropped that strap out of the way. <laughs> that that sounds like one. anybody familiar to you? Yeah, Frank. Every time we'll go in somewhere and he'll we'll go somewhere and he'll he'll get up a tree and he'll be like, 
I was in this tree before. Like there's a, I got up there and there's a bow hanger and then there's this and that and like the whole other thing. Like, oh, yeah. frick. Like, but I mean, that's the beauty of it is the little stuff that you find when you're out there and you have that kind of stuff happen. I mean, there is no place better to be than in the woods, whether you're successful or not successful, you're still successful. I mean, you're having a time of your life, you're enjoying it, you know, but people today, they just got to not get hooked up on all the antlers and hooked up on having to kill something. You know, that picture on Facebook is, is worthless. No, but nobody really cares. They just care that you're out there having fun. Your friends are there to support you in it. They don't care if it was a 120 inch or, or, uh, or uh, you know, a 40 inch. They, they don't care. They just want you to be out there having a good time and enjoying it. And if you're learning stuff and having fun, that's what it's all about. And so when you talk about learning stuff, you've put out a course now. Um, and, and how did that come about? I mean, you know, we, we talked a little bit about like where you were with your, um, your employment and how you switched over to a, a photography and you've got to spend more time in the woods and stuff like that. But you've kind of taken this, this podcasting, YouTubing thing and, and kind of, but kind of wanted to give more even yet. So, yeah, well, I, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, well, actually about five years ago, I put out a scouting DVD. Okay, it was uh, four hours long, two DVD set. It was one whole year from start to finish of how to scout uh, public lands and how to learn from it, and even some private stuff, cyber scouting, everything in it. And I put that DVD series out, and uh, and and people loved it. I don't know, I sold probably six, eight hundred of those things, um, and they ate it up. And uh, and so then uh, two years after that, or three, two year, two or three years after that, I put out another one, a more advanced one that filled in the gaps. And I put that DVD out, and that one went really well. Um, and then a year and a half ago, I wanted to, again, I want more time. I want to be able to be down South more in the winter and hunting. And in order to do that, I need to find some source of income that could let me do that. So I took a course on how to sell on Amazon, um, expensive one, $4,000 course. And, uh, um, I took that course and what I learned from it was I learned how to basically monetize a lot of stuff. And I did to Amazon. I failed and lost like 12 grand that first year in Amazon, but now it's actually making me good money and doing it. And then, but in the course from that course, it opened my mind up to a lot of things. And so that's when I started really attacking the YouTube. I had a channel already with like 1800 subscribers and I put a video out once a month. And then so, but then I started realizing the power of that affiliate marketing affiliate links. And um, so I started really ramping that up. Um, and then I uh, wanted to make another DVD and I thought, you know what, the problem with the DVDs are people have to keep buying my DVD. So they bought my first set. Then they got to buy my second set. Now I'm ready to put out another one. They got to buy those. And it's not really fair to the people to have to do that. What if there was a way that they could pay one time and always have access to whatever I want to give them? Because there's stuff I put on YouTube. I put a lot of hunting content on YouTube, but I'm not putting my deep, dark secrets and I'm not putting the, I, I'm not putting it out there for everybody just in general for free on YouTube. I mean, I put a ton of stuff there, but it's, it's like on YouTube, I'll tell you about uh, the funnels and I'll tell you how to do this. But if you want to learn about how to get those micro transitions and how to find them and I show me that stuff that I want to take a little deeper and, and, and it's not stuff that I'm putting out there just for everybody. Um, otherwise, if I do, then every time I walk in the woods, somebody's going to be shining a flashlight at me because they got there before I did. Um, so I thought, okay, well, instead of putting out another DVD, I need to find a platform that I can put this information into where people can access it anywhere. And then I can update it all the time. So I create, I started looking into courses cause I had taken that course. And so I thought, Hey, I made, I took a course and it was very beneficial and they update that course every year. I'm a member for life and I can always, I go on there when I want to learn about, you know, tag words and new, what new rules are. And I'm like, you know, that's what I need. So I created a course that started out as a six hour long course um, uh, called the bow hunting whitetails course. And it was an online course. And once you buy it, I, you get access to everything I put there forever. So you check back and I regularly, other than through hunting season, which I've been pretty busy, but normally I'm putting a new video on there about every two weeks, um, and updating it pretty constantly. Well, now it's up to like 18 hours long or something of just massive. It, it's everything there is that you could ever dream about, about bow hunting whitetails. And once you buy it, you get, I don't have to 
hit you up for another DVD two years later. It's always being updated with anything I want to put in there for you at any given time. And there's a chapter update section in there. So it shows you, you know, and I put out announcements in Facebook and uh, Instagram and stuff. And I say, Hey, new content added ch chapter updates. And so it tells you, so it's, it's a never ending. It's like a DVD, but um, it never ends. And you can watch it on your phone. You can watch it on your computer, your tablet, even on your TV. You can even be sitting in your tree stand and pull it up on your phone and go to chapter number 21 because it's a hot day where you are and you don't know what to do when the deer are moving on a hot day and look at that chapter and learn some of the tactics that could work for you. Um, so it's a very powerful resource that is designed to teach you how you know everything there is about hunting gear and it always updates and you always get that content for the one-time price of buying it at 75 bucks that's awesome i mean the the hard part in that is like where where's the ceiling right so i mean there's so much information you could dive in there forever and ever and ever um so do, on that DVD, one of the things that, you know, I, I mentioned to some of our listeners and some of our Patreons is uh, questions for for you and things like that. Now, how does scouting or hunting out of state, when you go into your out of state trips, do you go into that in your um, in the in the course, the difference between like your home state, out of state yes. type stuff? Yeah, and there's actually chapters in there for that, and it also shows you, um, I mean, in, in deer are deer pretty much everywhere, but the terrain does change, and it does cover that. There's a lot of stuff in there about how to hunt hill country, uh, which I hunt on all my state places are all hill country, and yet at home here where we are, it's all flat country where we are here, and, and so I spend a lot of time on that, and I also spend a lot of time in swamps. So there's things that teach you all of these things, and it's all... Um, the first part of the course, the first probably hour of the course is actually almost like a classroom setting on a whiteboard where we go over the rules of basically how a deer thinks, how they react, what matters to them, and take it on a pretty deep level. And then after that, everything else is 100% in field with me showing you from a tree stand, from the ground, taking you out there, explaining why. Look at here. This is nighttime sign. This is daytime sign. Yet they're only 10 yards apart. This is a difference. Here's the transition line. If you sit here, you're going to be pissed because you're not going to see any deer. But if you move over here eight yards, this is where you'll see 25 deer come through. Um, you know, there's, there's, you can't just say, I'm going to hunt a transition line. You have to know where on a transition line to be to take advantage of that. Well, this kind of you know it's all broken down in there and it's all real world and it's all in the field with me showing you and then i show you this and i explain it to you from the field and then i say okay now watch in a minute and right now for you guys that are in a course here it is i'm going to bring you into my computer and then i show it to you on google earth and explain why and let you see it firsthand so like i said it's stuff that i would never take the time to do for no offense to anybody, but for the general public. But I'm not take, I'm not putting that kind of time and effort into something that I'm going to put out there for free when, like I said, um, I would do it in a DVD form, which is what I did in the past for people that were serious and diehard about it. Uh, but then, like I said, the DVDs, the thing that bothered me about it was you're constantly nickel and diamond people to buy more of them. Well, this course solved that problem. You buy it once, you get the information for life, you know. And so this is all, uh, There's a, it's video content for the most part. 100% video content. Yep. Okay. And and from hearing you talk about it before, I didn't, I mean, I guess I gleaned that there was a little bit of, uh, it was video heavy, but because I, when I think of a course, I think of having to read stuff and I'm like, well, you know, I don't know about. <laughs> yep. Nope. This is 100% videos. Every, everything is all 100% video. There is no, uh, no documents in it at all. It's just all video. I, that's awesome. Cause I think, I mean, that's the way everything is going. You know, we're trying to do more video with the podcast and 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 things like that. Video is is king, and it's I don't know. I think it's harder to digest that content. I think with the podcast type scenario, it's easier for people to do it, like when they're at work or when they're driving. But outside of those aspects of it. I think video drives everything and it's a lot easier. I mean, myself, I'm a visual learner. And so unless, like I said, where I've seen a scenario where I'm like, and then somebody tells me, but when I read it, it's like, 
you know, there's, there's so many processes that have to happen before I can, I can put it all together. So I think that's really, really just awesome that it's all video and being able to say, this is this. And so instead of doing the DVDs, when I, when I was thinking of the course, I was, I always think of like reading it or having to like a, an exam at the end, I guess. I don't know. It's because I spent so many years in school. And that's good that you say that because maybe I'm going to change the name of it so it says video course in it. Maybe that's a good thing to have because you, maybe there's a lot of people thinking that. But you're right. I mean, I can, if somebody if somebody asks, uh, what do you do with your tree stand when you walk in the woods? If I say, oh, I strap it on my backpack, okay, that doesn't mean nothing because they, they don't know if it's – is it uh, uh, seat up, seat down? Is it on the back? Is it sideways? Where, where are my sticks? What's happening? But if I shoot a video real quick that shows me wearing that backpack with the stick and stands on there or even a picture – Visually, you answer a hundred questions right there on the spot that are solved for you versus words. And what you just said there is like what I've been thinking the whole time. It's like I, we definitely need to have a whole separate podcast just on gear um, because one, you said your backpack and where I thought you were going to go with that was is it on your Jansport? Is it on the field line from Walmart? Is it Exo Mountain Gear, which it probably is? Um, is it Kafaru? Is it, you know, there, I heard you on another podcast and you said, you know, we've had Garrett Prawl on the podcast. You were on the podcast with him and, and Bobby um, and, and said, you know, I haven't run into somebody that's more gear oriented than you. Um, and I think you were saying that to Garrett and it's like, yep. for, for you, it's really interesting because you don't, that's why I said that, that, that 10 things to buy and 10 things not to buy is probably the most prolific podcast that I've heard because it addresses like that. Uh, again, I'm the color commentary. John's the expert, but I'm the guy that spends the money on all the useless shit just to prove that it's yep. useless or that it's helpful. And John's a little bit more pragmatic in saying like, I'm going to spend as much money as I possibly can for one thing and as, never have to buy it again. As much money as I need to spend. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no. That, well, that's the key. <laughs> and yep, that is the key. And that's you know, I'm, what, I'm the guy out there that's running around with $2,000 binoculars and a $600 backpack. But on the same note, I'm wearing $10 Walmart pants and a $8 Bass Pro Shops clearance flannel shirt, you know? Yeah. And, and that's what I mean is like, there are so many people, like I said, like for myself, if, if you want to be a gear guy, I personally, I think, and I think you've surpassed it like to a point, maybe John has, and I just wasn't there for the, that inclination of it. But like, you have to try so many things to realize like which one is the best. And I've heard you talk about, uh, I mean, honest to God, $5,000 worth of packs, whether it's Mystery Ranch or Everly Stock or Kafaro or Exo or, or, or wherever you land in the spectrum, just to see which one you end up back, it seems like, with with Exo. And that's what I'm actually with. Yeah. And now I actually have the last, uh, I bought a mystery range Pintler pack, um, about, uh, four weeks ago and I'm mm-hmm. loving it. It's actually going to replace my Exo for my out of state trips this year. I'll tell you what, that pack is pretty incredible. Um, there, there are a lot of good ones out there, but everybody's body's different, you know, so you want to try them and see, um, I haven't ever tried a Kafaru. Um, it's on my to-do list and I, I've worn them, um, but I never hunted with one, but I got, you know, Kevin from the deer hunting podcast has got one. Um, I, I know a few people that have them and they're, they're incredible. There's a lot of great packs and a lot of great gear out there, but the key thing is to get the gear that's going to benefit you the most is where you want to spend the money on, whether it's a backpack, if you're going to be packing deer out of the woods, um, on your back and boning them out, then a backpack with a frame pack is a essential piece of equipment for you spend the money on it but uh if you're going to be um if you're going to be hunting out west um and you're going on a on a spot and stock mule deer hunt either rent them or buy them but you're going to need really good glasses they're going to be essential for your hunt but after you've bought those if you then have money left over for a nice sitka jacket or uh some kafaru or king of the mountain wool or what you know um kuyu pants or whatever it is you need 
uh, then spend the money on them. But if you don't have that money, you don't need, you know, you gotta, you gotta match your priorities with what's most important there and what you can and can't get. But like you said, there's some people that, that are so, they spend so much in gear that they don't get to spend any time hunting, you know? Oh, and you know, I- like I said, I, I would love, I, I can't wait to do this again, to just to talk about gear and your perspective on it, because I think it's great. I think that all of our listeners should go listen to Jason's podcast on everything, whether you're a crossbow hunter, traditional hunter, uh, compound hunter, gun hunter, it doesn't really matter because where Jason stands on gear is very um, purpose built. I think. And, and that's kind of like what you were saying is that it's gotta be for what you're doing rather than what social media says is cool or what the, the hottest name says that it's going to help you out. I mean, John yep. probably doesn't need his exo pack to get his stand and sticks in and out of the woods. He did it for 40 years before that without doing it. But if you've got the money, it makes it a lot easier. Well, I bought my actual pack to go out west right. on our on our yep. western hunt, and it just happens that it transitions great into to the whitetail, too. I mean, so, and, you know, it's perfect. Did you get the K2000? I have the, I have the 3500. Nice. Yep. And, yeah. Yeah, and, and I... I I'm with you. I love that exo bag a lot. Um, I have the 2000 is the one I got and I wanted something a little bigger. They don't sell the ones like you and I have with the titanium frames anymore. Now they're a new one with, uh, with an aluminum frame and it packs a little different. You know how like your stretch pocket zips, the new one does. And there's some things on it. I couldn't find enough info. And so I, I was about to pull the trigger on it at 3,500, but that's where I found this mystery range Pintler. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to try this out. I hear a lot of great things about them and I got to smoke a deal. I got it brand new for 350 bucks oh, um, because they're coming out with a new frame. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to jump on it and I love it. But I'll tell you what, that exo pack has been, I, I've packed uh, about 13 or 14 deer out on that pack. And one time, uh, one of the biggest ones I had, a, I had a whole, you know, a, a pretty decent, pretty big buck, uh, buck in there and my sticks and my stand and my gear and well, all that stuff. I'll bet that load was 110, 115 pounds <laughs> and, uh, hiked that thing out for almost two miles, man. That was brutal. Every stump I could find, I was dropping that, you know, resting that pack in my butt on to take a break every once in a oh, while, yeah. but that pack held up. It, it, that is one of the toughest packs I've ever owned in my life. Yeah. I, the the ones we have or the one I have is the K2 frame. They came out with the K3 frame, but they also came out <clears throat> with a new bag uh, that, that will go on either the K2 or the K3. It's the 1800 bag, which, and it's like 200 bucks, but I'm like, for man, the bag only, yep. for the bag only, I'm like, man, that's even, that's even better. Cause then the, the 3,500 is pretty big for, you know, whitetail hunting. And, uh, but I mean, it fits all my camera gear and the camera arm, especially, but Next year, my goal for next year is to trim down all the the waste because <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, my pack right now, like during the cold weather hunts, still fifty two pounds with you know my sticks, and that's and we we've switched to saddles, so that's not even a stand anymore. And yeah, yeah so, I think at the end of the season, you start out at the beginning, and you got everything fine tuned and in its place, and everything is all perfect. And then, uh, you know, that's like it, you know October first, and then by the time January first rolls around, I got like twenty four pounds of candy wrappers and crap, <laughs> and you know, hand warmer wrappers, and I think I even have like paper plates and old sandwiches in there somewhere, <laughs> you know. But it's amazing what you end up with in your pack by the end of the season. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm like, I feel like I'm on the opposite of you guys is that I've. I've changed so much. I'm on my third camera arm. I'm on my second camera. I've got so many different things. Like I am every hunt. I feel like I am fine tuning, but like I said, with like the gear side of it is like, I, I will just change up everything every time, like to figure it out. Like I, I, I've, I've seen your videos and like, I know your system is like, far more refined than mine uh but with this filming it's like i'm trying to cut and i'm just trying to make it as streamlined as possible and i just i haven't found it yet but it's it's a uh, <laughs> 
it's an evolution for sure. It's a work in progress. <laughs> but it's still it's getting a lot better. Like I said, when I had single string productions back in in the early two thousands, I mean that camera. I mean I I think I my camera gear, not even counting my hunting gear, my camera gear was like twenty eight pounds. You know that I had to carry out there. It was insane. I mean you had to carry four batteries because if it was a cold day, you'd have to carry six batteries, and you had to keep rotating them in your chest pocket just to keep them warm enough so that they would actually give you fifteen minutes of footage. <laughs> you know, I mean, so you know, I mean it's it's getting a lot better every year and every time now, but. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so much to film and hunt. It's, I, I, like I said, I, I, I'm glad you do it and it's great to watch and you guys do a fantastic job of it. Like I said, I watched a few of your videos now. You're, uh, the one where you killed the, the, uh, four point. I watched the one where Frank missed those couple deer. I watched, I watched a lot of your videos and, uh, the quality of them is phenomenal and it's great that you're doing it because we really do enjoy watching them, but I definitely feel bad for you to have to do it because it's no fun. It's a pain in the rear. <laughs> Well, the worst part about it is that John gets my hand-me-down stuff, so it's like the stuff that I've I've got smaller, I've got more refined. John gets everything well, else. I've, <laughs> I've last year he gave me. I'm like I'll film, and I was dedicated last year. I carried the camera arm, I carried everything for on every hunt I went, and <clears throat> it's the freaking muddy pro, which is it's like the this, outfitter, yeah. uh, camera arm, which could probably hold those old cameras. It's it. The camera, the camera arm itself, I would bet you weighs eight pounds. <laughs> right, and, and I got a the Sony Handycam like that weighs about eight ounces. Right, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so, a little overkill. <laughs> yeah, way overkill. Like I'm, it, it's pretty ridiculous, but it works good. But that's what I'm. But I'm not gonna, uh, you know, like he's saying, it's is he throws me the hand me down stuff. I'm like I, I'm spending my money in different areas. Because I can just make that he stuff buys the work. One and done type stuff, and I've got yep. all that money he's got wrapped up in the pack and his bow and all of that stuff, in two bows, a hundred arrows, five cameras. I mean, the the amount of camera equipment that I have is unbelievable. And like you were talking about, like I have bought so much to try to make it better and easier and everything. But here's the thing. I, I hand my stuff down to John. John's a, uh, John's a killer. He, I mean, but he's not a filmer. Uh, he, well, do you tell him? Well, like I said, I, I've lugged the camera gear. Well, like last year, I mean, when I was, I, I got some good film of the, you know, like a nice little eight point and stuff like that. Some does. And then this year, you know, I, I'm bad at doing, like, the pre-hunt interview. I just want to get out there right. and hunt. The B-roll stuff? Yep. Yeah, the B-roll. And it's like, so, and then this, and I'm hunting with my son most of the times when we're going out of the out of town and stuff. So, we're heading up north and we hunt up towards Manistee. But anyway, we're heading up and we had scouted at some spots and it was starting to get late. And, you know, I'm like, well, we found some really good sign got up in the trees my ended up my son was looking the wrong way I was, we're only like 30 yards apart and uh he's looking the wrong way and i'm like man and i finally get his attention i'm like he sees he finally turns and sees the deer coming in but his bow is hanging up on the other side and i'm like well i guess i'll i'll take a shot you know i'll shoot shoot one of the there was three does coming in so i'm but in the meantime i started filming and so i'm you know i'm I got him in camera and then they, they get down like 15 yards from my son and they get his wind and they kind of spook back out and then they're going to go out on around this pothole. And so I'm, I'm ranging. I'm like, okay, there's open lane there, there. And then I'm like looking at the camera. I'm got him in the camera and then, okay, they're going on, they're going to be right there. And I range it one more time and I look down I'm like, oh yep, she's still in the, she's in the viewfinder. And of course, you know, on this little Sony Handycam, it's about a, three inch square <laughs> if, if that you know and, if you're looking for an ant on it the deer. Right. and i'm looking i'm like okay i can still see it in frame so i draw back you know perfect shot at and i look and i'm shooting the sure bright uh <laughs> knocks, knocks are bright knocks are bright and i look and i'm i didn't even follow the deer because i looked in the viewfinder and the knock isn't in there i'm like there's no green light what the hell and so then I kind of span around. I'm like, oh, shit. So I go back to where the knock is, and there it is. I mean, it's super bright. So I should have been able to see it. 
So I'm like, oh, shit. I quick <laughs> re- rewind it and play it. Sure enough, I was on the wrong freaking deer. So all that. <laughs> and she only went like 60 yards up over the hill and, you know, died. But And then my son, you know, he videoed me. You know, we're, we videoed the recovery and stuff. But I'm like, well, so much for being a freaking camera, man. You know, I'm like <laughs> view, f- yeah. filming the hunt. I'm lugging all this shit around all season and I screw it up. But... Yeah, I've been there. I, I killed one, and I killed a deer up in uh, uh, Unit 487, you know, the one that's up, uh, 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 what is it, a wassail up there. And uh, um, But I ended up killing a doe up there again back in the day when, it was, you know, it was a TB area, so I had an extra tag, went up there and uh, go to shoot a doe, and I, I shot that doe, and I'm like, okay, I looked down at the camera, and it's off. It's like, what is going on? <laughs> I didn't turn it off. The battery died right in the middle of this whole process. You know, it's like, oh, this stuff was so frustrating dealing with all that. I did record, um, I, I took my daughter on a bear hunt this year and it was her first bear hunt. And I recorded that whole thing all just with my cell phone, but I was in a stand right above her. You know, I wasn't hunting. I was just there for her where she was hunting. And, um, I watched her kill that bear. That, that was amazing. And that, to that video, I, that one's on my YouTube channel. That was incredible. Um, and, and was really fun. And, and that I, I really enjoyed because I get to relive her experience over and over again. Every time I watch that video, on, you know, I mean, I have it on my computer, right on my, um, you know, uh, on my desktop, her video of that. And I watch it all the time because it's, it, there's so much power to that video and being able to relive that experience. But as far as videotaping myself for other people to watch, I, I don't do it much. I do a lot of tips from the tree stand, you know, where I talk about stuff. But as far as like trying to film a shot, I'm not doing it. That's too much work, and I'm not bringing a camera on. <laughs> oh, it's it's been fun. I mean, like I say, it is the most uh, if a, you know for a regular guy that just wants to start, um, hell, a podcast, a YouTube channel, or whatever. Like, there's this weird period where it's like you hearing your own voice talking and saying, you know what am I doing with this? And John's come a long, long way, but getting him on camera and, and, and doing that is, is we're, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> you know, if you, if you watch Frank going, I miss that motherfucker. Like, you know, like it's, yeah. you know, it, he don't it's have real. a problem. <laughs> Frank's like a that one of Dan Infall. Did you guys see that video of Dan Infall? Just, I just watched it. It's just recap from his dear, that he killed last January, but it's so funny because he's sitting there and he, he shoots that deer, he ends up hitting in the spine, but as soon as he shoots, he hits that spine, you hear him yell the F word out as loud as you can. <laughs> like, oh, you know, right from the tree stand, he screams, and I'm like, yeah, been there. <laughs> you know, but that realness to it is has got a lot of power. But I know what you're talking about with John. I got my buddy Joe, I took him with me. He goes to Missouri with me every year, and uh, I tried doing one podcast with him, one podcast. First year we went, I'm like, you know, we're driving back in the car, and I'm like, so, Joe, you know, what did you think of hunting out of state? Your first out of state deer hunt, and, uh, you know, you ended up killing a nice eight point. How, well, how, tell me about the experience. It was really good. I liked it. Deer walked in. He stood there. I shot him. He died. I put him in the car, and we came back. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, we need a little more than this, you know? <laughs> yeah. And like I say, John's come a long way. You know, we got to, I'm really, really good at open ended questions now because it's like, <laughs> yeah, so how was that? Well, you know, it's, it, yeah, it was good. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, you know, what do, what do you got? Like hand and arm signals are, are, are really on point here in this, uh, this garage. <laughs> you guys your own eye language. <laughs> the brow comes up, keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh man, like I say, we, we need to do this again. Um, you know, it, being the proximity, we'll, we'll have to do it in person and, and, and do a video podcast with, uh, you know, talking about gear and, and other stuff. I mean, like I said, for our listeners, you've, you've got to check out all of Jason's content because there isn't a more like real, uh, down to earth and uh, we'll say fanatical, um, gear guy and it's all with reason it's not it's not sponsored by anybody nobody's telling him um you know we'll give you this money to to talk about this 
And most of the time, he's telling you not to buy stuff, and he's telling you to put your money uh, where you need to. And I think the number one thing on that podcast was don't buy anything until you buy an out-of-state tag or uh, tags for for your state and uh, over vacation time, vacation I mean, time. Yeah. Yep. I mean, yep. that's the most, I mean, and that's incredibly powerful for, for people that think that, you know, uh, well, I don't know what sick fanatic bibs cost or whatever, but it's like a $700 pair of pants. Um, you know, that's a, that's a lot of hunting time. So, yep. You know, I own, I, I actually bought uh, a couple of years ago, I bought a pair of Sitka Timberline pants. They're the only, they're the only advanced technical hunting pant that I own. Um, and I, uh, I, I own a Kuyu vest too. I own a couple pieces, but they're again, strategically purchased for a reason. But like give you an example, those pants, I've never worn it. I've always hunted in just regular cotton, you know, cargo pants. Um, and, you know, that's what I wear. Um, and it's they work for me and I, I don't worry about them, but, uh, um, I bought those because the first time I went to Kansas, there's all these deep 10 or 12 foot deep river cuts, like these little channels that come off of the rivers and they're dry, but you got to get down, you have to get down them and they're undercut. So you're basically sliding down on your butt. Um, and then you're crawling and climbing up on your hands and your knees to get out of them. And I was so tired of my knees and my, my ass being soaked from doing this stuff all the time that I, that's why I bought a pair of sick of Timberline pants. Cause they have waterproof knees, waterproof pants. Cause after, you know, two days into my first trip there, I wore my, uh, you know, I've always been a big fan of uh, high quality rain gear. So I've had, I had first light, um, a Kuyu chew catch jacket and first light boundary storm type pants with me. I wore those pants every single day for the rest of that hunt to keep me dry from that. And as soon as I came home from that hunt, I looked and I bought a pair of Sitka Timberline pants. I only wear those pants when I'm in Kansas and I wear them because I got to, I have to slide down these hills. I'm a short guy. I'm only five six. I mean, if they made boxers three inches longer, I'd have to wear his pants, <laughs> you know? Um, so for me, um, you know, trying to slide up and down those washes and do it, deal with that. I was, you know, always had a wet butt and wet knees. So those sick of Timberline pants, they solved that problem for me. I would have never bought them and paid the two, you know, I didn't even pay 230 bucks. I got them on sale because they were a, a closeout Moss model, but, uh, but I would have never paid that much money for them if I didn't need to have them. I went 25 years of hunting without needing them. As soon as I needed them, I bought them and I bought the best possible option that I could get for it. Same with a pack, like your Exo pack, you know, until I needed to have a high quality pack to be able to pack meat out. I, I didn't care and didn't spend the money on it. But once I started boning deer out in the field and packing them, I wanted the best for me, my highest capable, most durable, longest lasting pack that I could have. And that's what I bought. So, you know, buying, buying gear is good, but only buy the right gear. And when you need to have it, you know, not cause your buddy does. All right. Yeah. I mean, if I bought all the stuff that I buy and the stuff my buddy does, ugh. My wife would kill me because John <laughs> right. has all the expensive stuff and I have everything else and it's the same amount of money. Don't get me wrong, right. but, but I, I, I feel like I literally have to try it. But like I said, you know, I, I just really appreciate you taking the time and coming on with us tonight. Um, one of the things we always ask, and I, you know, we, I think we dropped the ball in the last one is, uh, we ask, what is your bow setup? That's kind of John's. I asked him last time. We, we talked about his arrow weights and stuff. I mean, for a traditional guy, it's a little... It's a little weird. Yeah. You know, because we don't... We, you could <clears throat> tell us that you were shooting anything, and we'd be like, oh, yeah, awesome. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, what is it that... Uh, what's the bow that you're shooting in your arrows, arrow weight? And are you shooting carbon, wood arrows? Yeah, we did talk about wood arrows. And then what I want to know, and maybe our listeners want to know, but... Like I said, I don't really care. I, I want to know. So it's just, we're going to educate people. Uh, what's the difference between longbow, recurve, reflex, deflex, all this uh, type of stuff? So w what are you shooting and, and, and uh, you know, kind of go into that sort of side of it? Okay. Well, I shoot what's considered a hill 
a hill style longbow or a American semi longbow. This is a, my bows are basically, they are still laminated. So it is a core wood and a limb wood and then fiberglass front and back, like a, you know, like your, a lot of your traditional bows are, but my bow is a hundred percent straight top to bottom. There is no reflex, no deflex. There is no uh, locator or dish to the handle. It is a straight broomstick handle. It is a standard classic, uh, like Howard Hill would shoot longbow. Um, and I'm, I had mine made by Steve Ture over at Northern Miss Longbows. I shot a lot of bows, but uh, I met him and had my first bow made by him about six years ago. And now I own, I think, five bows of his, five or six. Um, and I, I love his bows. They're, they're the best bows I've ever shot. And uh, so I have him build them. Um, and I shoot, like I said, a hill-style bow. My bow is 57 pounds at my 26-inch draw length. And uh, I make my own strings. And... Uh, my arrows, I do shoot carbon. I shot wood for a lot of years. I love wood arrows. I, and you can even get a wood arrow that's more durable than any carbon arrow you could ever be or could ever find if they're built right and footed right. Um, but wood arrows require a major time commitment to be to, to make them and do them. Um, and uh, so I, I don't shoot, I haven't shot wood in quite a while. Um, actually, I haven't shot wood in about 18 years because once we had kids, it was where I just never found the time to make them anymore. So I shoot carbon now. Uh, but my car, my arrows are 725 grains um, out of a 57-pound bow, and I custom make my own double inserts. Uh, I take 200-grain brass inserts, and I take one of them, and I use my grinder, and I grind uh, the lip for the front of it off so that I can turn it around and put them back to back. And then I uh, stick a finishing nail in there, pound it down to lock them in together and glue them together, and I stick that whole 3-inch long 200-grain insert into the shaft um, and then I use a, broad, a steel 100 grain broadhead adapter and a 150 grain uh, Magnus One two blade, one and a half inch wide broadhead. So I got 30, almost 31 percent forward to center weight, and uh, it's uh, 450 grains up front on a 720 grain arrow. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> yeah. The arrows matter. For a traditional guy, we can't tune our bows. And uh, we also don't shoot far distances. So for us, it's all about, uh, you know, and, and also they're, they're slow. I mean, my bow shoots so slow that if I take a 30-yard shot at a 3D range, if nobody else is around and I shoot and let go of that string, if I don't like where that arrow's heading, if I got my Nikes on, I can run down there and catch it arrow before it gets to the target. <laughs> you know? So we, we need the penetration. We need the power. We need the momentum. And uh, it's funny because, uh, I mean, I can't think of uh, – actually, that buck I killed in Kansas because I went through his uh, – I hit him and then I stuck in his elbow knuckle on the other side um, on exit. That's what stopped it. But uh, other than that, I mean, I don't think I have I, – I mean, I can't tell you the last time I didn't blow through an animal, you know, with the arrow sticking in the dirt on the other side. And that's 57 pounds with a little – you know, 26 inch draw. I mean, that, my draw is so short that if you, I could probably take the limbs off of a crossbow and just get rid of the stock and shoot it like a reeker. You know? <laughs> so it's uh yeah. So that's, you know, that's the setup. Now, as far as uh, a difference in bows, what separates a recurve from a longbow is on a recurve, the string touches the back of the limbs somewhere along the route. Okay. So like how to recurve, how the string comes up and hits it on that curl, right where the limb tip curls. That's what designates it as a recurve is the string comes in contact with the limbs before it reaches the, the knock points, you know, on there. Um, so that's technically the legal classification. Um, but recurves are very nice, but they're, uh, and they're very springy feeling and they got, they, um, you know, you feel the limb tips open, you feel the main limbs bend. Um, and they're also a very easy transition from compound guys because you do usually shoot most recurves are set up with the same kind of a uh, almost I call it like a pistol grip like you have on a on a compound bow um, and you have that bigger shelf and uh, you have that real big sight window um, and so they're very easy transitions um, from a compound to a recurve and uh, and they're solid bows they're rock solid and they're usually recurve is usually a little faster than a long bow there are exceptions but typically speaking they're faster. Um, and then a longbow, there are basically, um, there is basically like, there's just quite a few subcategories of it. A reflex deflex bow is one that's going to have it where it's the limbs are going to kind of curl a little bit. They lean forward and then they tip, or they tip backwards from the riser and then they tip forward again. That's the reflex and the deflex. And that's designed to give it a little more speed to it. You know, you're going to have a little more speed out of them. There are hybrid bows that take that to a much more exaggerated level. You see a lot of those today. They look more like a V shape when they're strung than like a D shape, like a normal longbow would be. Um, 
And, uh, and there, there's a lot of great ones out there. I mean, you have an ASL style, American Semi Longbow, or a Hill style bow like I shoot, which is just a straight bow. There is no reflex or deflex to it. And then to get real technical, you have setback bows where the limbs angle back. You got, um, uh, you know, string follow bows. You got reverse handles. There's a lot of different categories to them, but basically keeping it simple, um, reflex and then uh, reflex deflex longbows. And then you have uh, hybrid longbows and then uh, hill style longbows and recurves are pretty much, you know, there's some variations there too, but for the most part, they're pretty much the same. Well, I, like I say, I, I appreciate that because, you could have said it, you know, I shoot this and that and that, and we'd have been like, oh, awesome, real cool. But, <laughs> like, you know, I, it's just not, it's not one of those things. And, uh, you know, I have a uh, Martin recurve takedown, uh, but it's built off of a compound riser. And what I'm finding is that, you know, I, I got it years, years ago uh, just to shoot chipmunks at our property. And, uh, we were, we were shooting them with compounds and destroying a bunch of arrows. Right. And, um, so I was like, well, I'll get a recurve. Well, I got a 50 pound recurve. I got a, what's my bow set at John? 29. Yeah. 29 inch. I got 29 inch draw and this is 50 at 28. So I drew this bow back the first time and I shot an arrow in my backyard and it blew right through my picket fence. And I was like, Whoa, this is not exactly what I expected out of a recurve. And, uh, you know, I mean, this is like a legitimate bow, but, uh, the Martin Jaguar happens to have a compound riser that's been had limbs built for it to be a recurve. So shooting it off the shelf, um, I gotta, I've, I'm going to have to build a, yeah, you pat it. Yeah, and I, I don't know anything about that. I didn't even know anything about that. I put a whisker biscuit on it, and I've just been shooting it that way with my compound arrows because, like I said, I just want to shoot chipmunks and red squirrels. And I I really enjoy shooting it. It's, <laughs> I would say, uh, 100% more difficult than shooting any compound that I've ever shot. But like you said, it's more like when I've been shooting at water bottles and all sorts of other stuff. And like when you hit it, it's like, like you said, it's like addicting. It's like there's a uh, a point to it where it's like, oh, my God, I need to do that again. And yep, fun factor. And so I need to, like you said, there's a much bigger sight window and it's, it's everything. I mean, I could put a sight on it. I could do all that. But I... I've been told by other people is like, you need to build up that shelf so that you can shoot it and just sight down the arrow. And like John, I'm, it's going to be one of those like cocaine type addictions of if I build this, then there's going to be repercussions, you know, <laughs> it, it's definitely a lot of fun. Do either of you guys ever been bow fishing? Oh, that's what I was going to say is I used to bow fish all the time. And I actually, we started out, we had like this old American compound and then, I had a, I ended up getting uh, a little uh, bear grizzly. It was like a forty five pounder or something, and that thing was, you know, there's no sights or anything. We, the only thing I had I had a reel tape to the front of it, <laughs> and that I mean that's so much that's so addicting. That's why I was telling Adam like, or if I if I go down this route, it's, it's probably not going to be good for my compounds. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to get you guys on the water this uh, this spring. I. Uh... I, I'm real big into bow fishing. That's what we. That's why I don't even turkey hunt. We bow fish so much all year. I actually, um, you know, I've had a few boats, but my last boat I had it custom built down in Alabama specifically for bow fishing, and uh, brought it up here. And this thing is amazing. And uh, you know, I'll get you guys out there on the water. But I mean, especially for bow fishing, traditional bows are amazing because you don't have to. You know, you can just shoot so fast with them, right. you know, and the shots are close and it's just never ending fun. And I got tons of, I got tons of bows, you know, I got all kinds of right-handed, left-handed bows. I got reels. I got everything. <laughs> I'll have to get you guys out there and give that a shot. You know, you do it at night in the dark. Um, you're out there on the water. I got, you know, lights generated. Like I said, it's quite the setup. And man, I'll tell you what, you want to talk about fun going out there and shoot, you know, 255 gallon drum full of carp and gar and stuff at the night. It's a blast. Oh yeah. That, we, we used to do it as, I mean, as teenagers, before we could drive, we'd have my dad drop us off at the lake and we would, he would drop us off as it was getting dark and he'd pick us up as it was getting daylight again. We'd literally, we would pull yep. 
all the way around what we lived close to Bear Lake and Muskegon Lake down here. And we'd start in Bear Lake. We'd go all the way around Bear Lake and then halfway around Muskegon Lake down, down to the cob plant and then all the way back with a, we had headlamp. No, we had, what we used to use was we had a two by four stuck up in the front. We had an old V bottom boat that we got from my grandma. Okay. Yep. And we'd stick a two by four and then we had a nail on it and we'd have a lantern up front, but then we'd have to tape that. Like one of the first times we did it, we almost lost the lantern because the, we burned right through the freaking uh, two by four. <laughs> so, right. so we had to wrap the two by four with tin foil. <laughs> and then we wrapped yeah. the back of the lantern with tin foil so it wasn't shining back in our face because we'd, we'd pull it back up. And that's how, <laughs> you know, we just, we had a little uh, Minn Kota trolling motor and had that on the back just for, you know, when we weren't in the weeds. But most of the time we were just pulling through the weeds, shooting yeah. carp and gar and, oh. Right. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a lot of fun. There's no doubt about it. You know, and you don't need a lot to do it. You know, like you said, you know, any bow will work. It just need a reel on the front. I mean, heck, my first bow fishing boat I did was a canoe, and I stood in it and floated down this river standing on it, and um, I only fell, like, I don't know, nine times. And then uh, so the next day I wanted to improve, improvise, so I took, like you did, I took a two-by-six. I C clamped it to the gun rails across that thing sideways when I got out there. And at the other end, I took an old cooler, old Coleman cooler, and I duct taped it shut and I screwed right through the two by four, through the two by six into that cooler. So it was like a little outrigger, three yep. feet out there, and that stabilized me. And I fished out of that thing for like a whole season before I bought my first boat, you know. And then I bought a used boat, and then, you know, one thing leads to another. But uh, it's something that you, you know, even fishing off the banks, it's, it's a lot of fun. But if you're. Look, if there's ever a reason for a compound guy to buy a traditional bow, it would be bow fishing. Get it from oh. a garage sale. Get a Samick Sage for 130 bucks. That Samick Sage bow that you can get is probably one of the most underrated bows in the world. That thing is phenomenal. We have like three or four of them here. Uh, both kids have one. My wife has one. Uh, we got spared for other people, but uh, that bow is awesome, and it's like $140. And if you want heavier limbs, they're like 40 bucks on Amazon. The thing's just incredible. Take down and everything for a dirt cheap price and a real good bow. But, you know, bow fishing, definitely the way to go for, you know, to, if you're playing with a traditional bow, that's, that kind of calls for it. It's a lot better shooting fish with a with a uh, with a recurve or a longbow than it is with a compound. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. I personally will take you up on that offer, and uh, whether oh well, yeah, you know, uh, I'm you definitely. Know, yeah, John, yeah you gotta have, you'll have a blast. It'll be an absolute riot. <laughs> Like I said, just don't put me on the bass. I'm a, I'm a bass layer. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just what it is. All oh, big fish. I couldn't hit the carp. I can tell you that. <laughs> Those are usually really big. <laughs> But, yeah, carp are big. Well, they got a lot of goldfish on the bay, and it's funny because my daughter has this obsession with shooting goldfish. And it's like we'll see a goldfish, and it's in like eight feet of water, and the thing's about the size. It's like the size of a freaking goldfish. And uh, well, I'll have to keep spinning that boat around while she shoots at this thing for like forty-five minutes straight. And this sister, it's like, come on, <laughs> let's go on to some other fish here. You know? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh man, I, like I said, I could talk to you for hours, and I can't wait to do this again in person to talk about gear uh but it sounds like the next podcast may be a bow fishing podcast and uh <laughs> i i i really can't wait to do it where can everybody follow along with everything that you're doing and and if they want to buy the course you know how do they go about doing that uh everything is on as far as the courses and uh the podcasts you can find the podcasts on uh itunes iHeartRadio, all that kind of stuff i think i'm on stitcher or spotify I, I don't know i haven't paid attention to those platforms in a while but um itunes iHeartRadio, and then all my podcasts are also on my website like if you want to download them and stuff tbw podcast stands for traditional bow hunting wilderness podcast tbw podcast.com is the website the courses are on there too. I have two courses. I have the bow hunting course. Then I also have, uh, if anybody's interested in, you know, getting ready to buy a new car or a new truck or a new side by side or boat or anything like that. Um, I have like insane mad skills at getting the absolute best price on all that stuff. And I actually have a course I put out that'll teach you how to, you know, just save incredible money. I only launched it three weeks ago and there's about uh, 40 people in it, but already since I launched it in three weeks ago, I've had four people already that have bought new trucks with it that have saved over 15,000, over 10, you know, over 20% on each one of their trucks they bought. So that's out there. That's courses on the website. 
Um, the videos, I'm a little slow at putting on the website, so I got to do it manually. So for the videos, uh, just go to YouTube and search for Traditional Bow Hunting and Wilderness Podcast. But you'll find my channel right there. But um, I do eventually put them on the podcast. I'm just pretty slow. I think I'm about three months of videos behind right now because it's just a pain in the butt to load them or, you know, load them and label them and do everything on that actual website. But everything else on the website, tbwpodcast.com, videos, hit YouTube, search for Traditional Bow Hunting Wilderness Podcast. Well, I mean, <laughs> this is a lot of fun. I... You know, I, I drag John into these podcasts, kicking and screaming. I tell him, this is, <laughs> it, it, this is when it's going to be. You show up and we'll, we'll do this. You impart your knowledge and uh, I'll impart my people skills. And that's, uh, that's kind of how we do these. But this has been a lot of fun and I do really appreciate it. But I think those are all the questions and everything we got for this evening. So I, I perfect. Really well, I'm looking. Looking forward to doing it again, and anytime, you know, anytime you want to. Like I said, one of these days, I'll, uh, I'm gonna learn how to um, do interviews. I gotta, I gotta solve that and figure it out. Maybe I'll have you guys on this show. Uh, maybe once we get you out there on the boat, we'll bring you on and you can talk about your boat fishing experiences and oh. stuff like that too. So that'll be perfect, man. That'd be that'd great. Be awesome. Sounds like a plan. All right. All right. Thanks.